the conjure woman by charles waddell chestnut the gooford grapevine some years ago my wife was in poor health and our family doctor in whose skill and honesty i had implicit confidence advised a change of climate i shared from an unprofessional standpoint his opinion that the raw winds and the chill rains and the violent changes of temperature that characterized the winters in the region of the great lakes tended to aggravate my wife's difficulty and would undoubtedly shorten her life if she remained exposed to them the doctor's advice was that we seek not a temporary place of sojourn but a permanent residence in a warmer and more equable climate I was engaged at the time in grape culture in northern Ohio, and as I liked the business and had given it much study, I decided to look for some other locality suitable for carrying it on. I thought of sunny France, of sleepy Spain, of southern California, but there were objections to them all. It occurred to me that I might find what I wanted in some one of our own southern states. It was a sufficient time after the war for conditions in the South to have become somewhat settled, and I was enough of a pioneer to start a new industry if I could not find a place where grape culture had been tried. I wrote to a cousin who had gone into the turpentine business in central North Carolina. He assured me, in response to my inquiries, that no better place could be found in the South than the state and neighborhood where he lived. The climate was perfect for health, and, in conjunction with the soil, ideal for grape culture. Labor was cheap, and land could be bought for a mere song. He gave us a cordial invitation to come and visit him while he looked into the matter. We accepted the invitation, and, after several days of leisurely travel, the last hundred miles of which were up a river on a sidewheel steamer, we reached our destination a quaint old town which i shall call patesville because for one reason that is not its name there was a red brick market house in the public square with a tall tower which held a four-faced clock that struck the hours and from which there pealed out a curfew at nine o'clock there were two or three hotels a courthouse a jail stores offices and all the appurtenances of a county seat and a commercial emporium. For while Patesville numbered only four or five thousand inhabitants, of all shades of complexion, it was one of the principal towns in North Carolina, and had a considerable trade in cotton and naval stores. This business activity was not immediately apparent to my unaccustomed eyes. Indeed, when I first saw the town, there brooded over it a calm that seemed almost sabbatic in its restfulness, though I learned later on that, underneath its somnolent exterior, the deeper currents of life, love and hatred, joy and despair, ambition and avarice, faith and friendship, flowed not less steadily than in livelier latitudes. We found the weather delightful at that season, the end of summer, and were hospitably entertained. Our host was a man of means, and evidently regarded our visit as a pleasure, and we were therefore correspondingly at our ease, and in a position to act with the coolness of judgment desirable in making so radical a change in our lives. My cousin placed a horse and buggy at our disposal, and himself acted as our guide until I became somewhat familiar with the country. I found that grape culture, while it had never been carried on to any great extent, was not entirely unknown in the neighborhood. Several planters thereabouts had attempted it on a commercial scale, in former years, with greater or less success. But, like most southern industries, it had felt the blight of war, and had fallen into desuetude. I went several times to look at a place that I thought might suit me. It was a plantation of considerable extent that had formerly belonged to a wealthy man by the name of McAdoo. The estate had been for years involved in litigation between disputing heirs, during which period shiftless cultivation had well nigh exhausted the soil. There had been a vineyard of some extent on the place, but it had not been attended to since the war, 
and had lapsed into utter neglect. The vines, here partly supported by decayed and broken-down trellises, were twining themselves among the branches of the slender saplings which had sprung up among them, grew in wild and unpruned luxuriance, and the few scattered grapes they bore were the undisputed prey of the first comer. The site was admirably adapted to grape-raising. The soil, with a little attention, could not have been better, and with the native grape, the luscious scuppernong, as my main reliance in the beginning, I felt sure that I could introduce and cultivate successfully a number of other varieties. One day I went over with my wife to show her the place. We drove out of the town over a long wooden bridge that spanned a spreading mill-pond, past the long whitewashed fence surrounding the county fairground, and struck into a road so sandy that the horse's feet sank to the fetlocks. Our route lay partly uphill and partly down, for we were in the Sandhill County. We drove past cultivated farms, and then by abandoned fields grown up in scrub oak and short-leaved pine, and once or twice through the solemn aisles of the virgin forest, where the tall pines, well nigh meeting over the narrow road, shut out the sun, and wrapped us in cloistral solitude. Once, at a crossroads, I was in doubt as to the turn to take, and we sat there waiting ten minutes. We had already caught some of the native infection of the restlessness for some human being to come along who could direct us on our way. At length a little negro girl appeared, walking straight as an arrow, with a piggin full of water on her head. After a little patient investigation necessary to overcome the child's shyness, we learned what we wished to know, and at the end of about five miles from the town reached our destination. We drove between a pair of decayed gate-posts. The gate itself had long since disappeared, and up a straight sandy lane between two lines of rotting rail-fence, partly concealed by jimson weeds and briars, to the open space where a dwelling-house had once stood, evidently a spacious mansion, if we might judge from the ruined chimneys that were still standing, and the brick pillars on which the sills rested. The house itself, we had been informed, had fallen a victim to the fortunes of war. We alighted from the buggy, walked about the yard for a while, and then wandered off into the adjoining vineyard. Upon Annie's complaining of weariness, I led the way back to the yard, where a pine log, lying under a spreading elm, afforded a shady though somewhat hard seat. One end of the log was already occupied by a venerable-looking colored man. He held on his knees a hat full of grapes, over which he was smacking his lips with great gusto, and a pile of grape-skins near him indicated that the performance was no new thing. We approached him at an angle from the rear, and were close to him before he perceived us. He respectfully rose as we drew near, and was moving away when I begged him to keep his seat. "'Don't let us disturb you,' I said. "'There is plenty of room for us all.' He resumed his seat with somewhat of embarrassment. While he had been standing, I had observed that he was a tall man and, though slightly bowed by the weight of years, apparently quite vigorous. He was not entirely black, and this fact, together with the quality of his hair, which was about six inches long and very bushy, except on the top of his head, where he was quite bald, suggested a slight strain of other than negro blood. There was a shrewdness in his eyes, too, which was not altogether African, and which, as we afterwards learned from experience, was indicative of a corresponding shrewdness in his character. He went on eating the grapes, but did not seem to enjoy himself quite so well as he had apparently done before he became aware of our presence. "'Do you live around here?' I asked, anxious to put him at his ease. "'Yes, sir.' I lives dares over yonder, behind the next sand hill, on the Lumberton Plank Road. Do you know anything about the time when this vineyard was cultivated? Lord bless you, sir, I knows all about it. 
there ain't ne'er a man in this settlement what won't tell you old Julius McAdoo was born and raised on this year's same plantation. Is you the northern gentleman what's going to buy the old vineyard? I am looking at it, I replied, but I don't know that I shall care to buy unless I can be reasonably sure of making something out of it. Well, sir, you was a stranger to me, and I is a stranger to you, and we is both strangers to one another. But if I was in your place, I wouldn't buy this vineyard. Why not? I asked. Well, I don't know whether you believes in conjuring or not. Some of the white folks don't, or says they don't. But the truth of the matter is that this year old vineyard is goofered. Is what? I asked, not grasping the meaning of this unfamiliar word. Is goofered, conjured, bewitch? He imparted this information with such solemn earnestness and with such an air of confidential mystery that I felt somewhat interested, while Annie was evidently much impressed and drew closer to me. How do you know it is bewitched? I asked. I wouldn't spec for you to believe me lest you know all about the facts, but if you and young Miss Dare don't mind listening to a old nigger run on a minute or two while you're resting, I can explain to you how it all happened. We assured him that we would be glad to hear how it all happened, and he began to tell us. At first, the current of his memory, or imagination, seemed somewhat sluggish, but as his embarrassment wore off, his language flowed more freely, and the story acquired perspective and coherence. As he became more and more absorbed in the narrative, his eyes assumed a dreamy expression, and he seemed to lose sight of his auditors and to be living over again in monologue his life on the old plantation. Old oh, Mas Dougal McAdoo, he began, bought this place long many year before the woe, and I remember well when he sought out all this year part of the plantation in the scuppernings. The vimes growed monstrous fast and Ma's Dougal made a thousand gallon of scuppernin' wine every year. Now, if days anything a nigger love, next to possum and chicken and watermelons, it's scuppernins. There ain't nothin' that can stand up in the scuppernin' for sweetness. Sugar ain't a circumstance to scuppernin'. When the season is nigh about over, and the grapes begin to swivel up just a little with the wrinkles of old age, when the skin gets soft and brown, then the scuppin' and make you smack your lip and roll your eye and wash for mo. So I reckon it ain't very astonishing that niggers love scuppin'. And. There was a sight of niggers in the neighborhood of the vineyard. It was old Mars Henry Brayboy's niggers, and old Mars Jeems McLean's niggers, and Mars Dougal's own niggers. Then there was a settlement of free niggers and poor buckras down by the Wimberton Road, and Mars Dougal's had the only vineyard in the neighborhood. I reckon it ain't so much nowadays, but before the war and slavery times, a nigger didn't mind going five ten mile in the night when there was something good to eat at the other end. So after a while, Mars Dougal began to miss his scuppernings. Cause he accused the niggers of it, but they all denied it to the last. Mars Dougal sought spring guns and steel traps, and he and overseer sat up nights once or twice till one night Mars Dougal, He's a monstrous careless man, got his legs shot full of cow peas, but somehow or another they could never catch none of the niggers. I don't know how it happened, but it happened just like I tell you, and the grapes kept on a going just the same. But by and by old Mas Dougal fix up a plan to stop it. There was a conjure woman living down amongst the free niggers on the Wilmington Road, and all the dockies from Rockfish to Beaver Creek was feared of her. She could work the most powerfulest kind of goofer, could make people have fits, or rheumatiz, or make them just dwindle away and die, and they say she went out riding the niggers at night, for she was a witch size being a conjure woman. Master Duga heard about Aunt Peggy's doings, and began to reflect whether or no he couldn't get her to help him keep the niggers off in the grapevines. One day, in the spring of the year, old Miss pack up a basket of chicken and pound cake, and a bottle of scuppin' and wine. And Mas Dougal tuck it in his buggy and drive over to Aunt Peggy's cabin. 
he took the basket in and had a long talk with Aunt Peggy. The next day, Aunt Peggy come up to the vineyard. The niggas seed her slipping round, and they soon found out what she was doing there. Mas Dougal had hired her to goof at the grapevines. She sat it round amongst the vines and took a leaf from this one and a grape hole from that one and a grape seed from another one and then a little twig from here and a little pinch of dirt from there and put it all in a big black bottle with a snake's tooth and a speckled hen's gall and some hairs from a black cat's tail and then filled the bottle with scuppin' and wine. When she got the goofer all ready and fixed, she took and went out in the woods and buried it under the root of a red oak tree, and then come back and told one of the niggers she done goofed the grapevines. And there a nigger what eat them grapes would be sure to die inside twelve months. After that, the niggers let the scuppinins loan, and Mas Dugo didn't have no occasion to find no more fault and the season was most gone when a strange gentleman stopped at the plantation one night to see Mas Dougal on some business. And his coachman, seeing the scuppinins growing so nice and sweet, slipped round behind the smokehouse and ate all the scuppinins he could hold. Nobody didn't notice it at the time, but that night, on the way home, the gentleman's hoss runned away and killed the coachman. When we heard the news, and Lucy the cook, she up and say she see the strange nigger eating at a scuppinins behind the smokehouse. And then we knowed the goofer had been a-workin'. Then one of the nigger chillins runned away from the quarters one day and got in the scuppinins and died the next week. White folks say he died of the fever, but the niggers knowed it was the goofer. So you can be sure the darkies didn't have much to do with them scuppinin vines. When the scuppinin season was over for that year, Mas Dougal found he had made fifteen hundred gallon of wine, and one of the niggers heard him laughing with the overseer fit to kill, and saying them fifteen hundred gallon of wine was monstrous good interest on the ten dollars he laid out on the vineyard. So I allows he paid Aunt Peggy ten dollars for the goof of the grapevines. The goofer didn't work no more till the next summer, when long towards the middle of the season, one of the field hands died. And as that let Mas Dougal short of hands, he went off to town for to buy another. He fetched a new nigger home with him. He was a old nigger at a cutter of a ginger cake, and bald as a hoss apple on the top of his head. He was a pert old nigger though. He could do a big day's work. Now, it happened that one of the niggers on the next plantation, one of old Mas Henry Brayboy's niggers, had run away the day before and took to the swamp and old Mars Dougal and some of the other neighbor white folks had gone out with the guns and the dogs for to help em hunt for the nigger. And the hands on our own plantation was all so flusterated that we forgot to tell the new hand about the goofer on the scuppin' and vimes. Cause he smelled the grapes and the seed of vimes, and at the dock, the first thing he done was to slip off to the grape vimes without saying nothing to nobody. Next morning he told some of the niggers about the fine bait of scuppin' he had the night before. When they told him about the goofer on the grapevimes, he is that terrified that he turned pale and looked just like he gonna die right in his tracks. The overseer come up and asked what is the matter, and when they told him Henry been eatin' of the scuppinins, and he got goofer on him, he gin Henry a big drink of whiskey, and loud at the next rainy day he take him over to Aunt Peggy's and see if she wouldn't take the goof off of him, seeing as he didn't know nothing about it till he done ate the grapes. Show sure enough, it rained the next day, and the overseer went over to Aunt Peggy's with Henry. And Aunt Peggy say that, being as Henry didn't know about the goofer, and ate the grapes in ignorance of the consequences, she reckoned she might be able for to take the goofing off of him. So she fetch out a bottle with some conjure medicine in it, and pour some out in a gold for Henry to drink. He managed to get it down. He say it tastes like whiskey with something bitter in it. She allowed that to keep the goof off of him till next spring, but when the sap began to rise in the grapevines, he had to come and see her again, and she tell him what else to do. Next spring, when the sap commenced to rise in the scuppin' vine, Henry took a ham one night. Where'd he get the ham, I don't know. There wasn't no hams on the plantation exceptin' what is in the smokehouse, but I never see Henry about the smokehouse. But as I was saying, 
he took the ham over to Aunt Peggy's, and Aunt Peggy told him that when Mas Dougal began to prune the grapevines, he must go and take and scrape off the sap where it ooze out of the cuttings of the vines, and knowing his bald head with it. And if he do that once a year, the goofer wouldn't work again him long as he done it. And being as he fetch her the ham, she fix it so he can eat all the scuppin' and he won't. So Henry gnawin' his head with the sap out in the big grape vine just halfway twixt the quarters and the big house, and the goofer never woke again him that summer. But the beatinest thing you ever see happen to Henry. Up to that time he was as bald as a sweet and tater, but just as soon as the young leaves begun to come out on the grape vines, the hair began to grow out on Henry's head, and by the middle of the summer he had the biggest head of hair on the plantation. Before that, Henry had tolerable good hair round the edges, but as soon as the young grapes began to come, Henry's hair began to curl all up in little balls, just like his hair regular grappy hair, and by the time the grapes got ripe, his head looked just like a bunch of grapes. Combing it didn't do no good. He woke at it half the night with a Jim Crow, and think he'd get it straightened out, but in the morning the grapes would be there just the same. So he gin it up, and tried to keep the grapes down by having his hair cut short. Footnote. A small card, resembling a curry comb in construction, and used by Negroes in the rural districts instead of a comb. End footnote. But that wasn't a queryest thing about the goofer. When Henry come to the plantation, he was getting a little old and stiff in the joints. But that summer, he got just as spry and lively as any young nigger on the plantation. Fact. He got so bigoted that Mas Jackson, the overseer, had to threaten to whip him if he didn't stop cutting up his dittos and behave himself. But the most cursed thing happened in the fall, when the sap began to go down in the grapevines. First, when the grapes was gathered, the knots began to straighten out in Henry's hair, and when the leaves began to fall, Henry's hair meant to drap out. And when the vines was bare, Henry's head was baller than it was in the spring and he began to get old and stiff in the joints again, and paid no more attention to the gals during the whole winter. And next spring, when he rubbed the sap on again, he got young again, and so supple and lively that none of the young niggers on the plantation couldn't jump, nor dance, nor hoe as much cotton as Henry. But in the fall of the year, his grapes minced to straighten out, and his joints to get stiff, and his hair drop off, and the rheumatic began to wrestle with him. Now, if you'd a knowed old Mas Dougal McAdoo, you'd a knowed that it had to be a mighty rainy day when he couldn't find something for his niggers to do, and it had to be a mighty little hole he couldn't crawl through, and had to be a monstrous cloudy night when a dollar get by him in the darkness. And when he see how Henry get young in the spring and old in the fall, he lied to himself as how he could make more money out in Henry than by working him in the cotton field. Long the next spring, after the sap minced to rise, and Henry anointed his head and started for to get young and supple, Master Dougal up and took Henry to town and sold him for fifteen hundred dollars. Cause the man what bought Henry didn't know nothing about the goofer, and Master Dougal didn't see no occasion for to tell him. Long towards the fall, when the sap went down, Henry began to get old again, same as usual and his new master began to get shared lessen he going to lose his fifteen hundred dollar nigger he sent for a mighty fine doctor but the medicine didn't appear to do no good the goofer had a good hold henry told the doctor about the goofer but the doctor just laugh at him one day in the winter mas dougal went to town and was santin along the main street when who should it meet but henry's new master they said howdy and Master Dougal asked him to have a cigar. And after they run on a while about the craps and the weather, Master Dougal asked him, sort of careless, like as if he just thought of it, How you like the nigger I saw you last spring? Henry's master shook his head and knocked the ashes off in his cigar. Speck I made a bad bargain when I bought that nigger. Henry done good work all the summer. But since the fall set in, he appears to be sort of pining away. There ain't nothing particular to matter with him, leastways the doctor say so, except in a touch of the rheumatiz. But his hair's all fell out, and if he don't pick up his strength mighty soon, 
I speck I'm going to lose them. They smoked on a while, and by and by old Ma say, Well, a bargain's a bargain, but you and me is good friends, and I don't want to see you lose all the money you paid for that nigger. And if what you say is so, and I ain't sputting it, he ain't worth much now. I specs you worked him too hard this summer, or else the swamps down here don't agree with the sand hill nigger. So you just let me know, and if he gets any wusser, I'll be willing to give you five hundred dollars for him, and take my chances on his living. Show sure enough, when Henry begun to draw up with the rheumatiz, and it looked like he going to die for show, his new massa sent for Massa Dougal, and Massa Dougal give him what he promised, and brung Henry home again. He took good care of him during the winter, give him whiskey to rub his rheumatiz and tobacco to smoke, and all he want to eat, cause a nigger what he could make a thousand dollars a year off and didn't grow on every huckleberry bush. Next spring, when the sap rise and Henry's hair commenced to sprout, Mas Dougal sold him again down in Robeson County this time, and he kept that selling business up for five year or more. Henry never say nothing about the goofer to his new masses, cause he know he gonna be took good care of the next winter when Massa Dougal buy him back. And Massa Dougal made enough money off in Henry to buy another plantation over on Beaver Creek. But long about the end of that five year, they come a stranger to stop at the plantation. The first day he is here, he went out with Massa Dougal and spent all the morning looking over the vineyard. And at the dinner they spent all the evening playing cards. The niggers soon discovered that he was a Yankee, and that he come down to North Carolina for to learn the white folks how to raise grapes and make wine. He promised Mars Dougal he could make the grape vines bear twice as many grapes, and that the new wine press he was a selling would make more than twice as many gallons of wine. And old Mars Dougal just drunk it all in, just appeared to be bewitched by that Yankee. When the darkies see that Yankee running round the vineyard and digging under the grape vines, they shook their heads, and loud that they feared Mars Dougal losing his mind. Mars Dougal had all the dirt dug away from under the roots of all the scupping em vines, and let him stand that way for a week or more. Then that Yankee made the niggers fix up a mixture of lime and ashes and manual, and pour it round the roots of the grape vines. Then he advised Mars Dougal for to trim the vines closer, and Mars Dougal took and done everything the Yankee told him to do. Doing all this time, mind you, this here Yankee was living off in the fat of the land at the big house, and playing cards with Mars Dougal every night, and they say Mars Dougal lost more than a thousand dollars during the week that Yankee was a ruin in the great vimes. When the sap rise next spring, old Henry anointed his head as usual, and his hair commenced to grow just the same as it done every year. The scupping and vimes growed monstrous fast and the leaves was greener and thicker than they ever been doing my remembrance. And Henry's hair growed out thicker than ever, and it appeared to get younger and younger, and suppler and suppler. And seeing as he was short of hands that spring, having took in considerable new ground, Mars Dougal concluded he wouldn't sell Henry till he get the crap in and the cotton chop. So he kept Henry on the plantation. But long about time for the grapes to come on the scupping and vimes, they appeared to come a change over em. The leaves withered and swivel up, and the young grapes turned yellow, and by and by everybody on the plantation could see that the whole vineyard was dying. Mars Dougal took him water to vimes and done all he could, but it wasn't no use. That Yankee had done bust a watermelon. One time the vines picked up a bit, and Mars Dougal allowed they was going to come out again, but that Yankee done dug too close under the roots and pruned the branches too close to the vine, and all that lime and ashes done burnt the life out in the vines, and they just keep a withering and a swivelin'. All this time the goofer was a workin'. When the vine started to wither, Henry minced to complain his rheumatiz, and when the leaves began to dry up, his hair minced to drap out. When the vines fresh up a bit, Henry'd get purred again, and when the vines withered again, Henry'd get old again, and just kept getting more and more fitting for nothing. He just pined away, and pined away, and finally took to his cabin. And when the big vine, where he got the sap to anoint his head, withered and turned yellow and died, Henry died too, just 
went out sort of like a cannon. They didn't appear to be nothing matter with him, except the rheumatiz, but his strength just dwindled away till he didn't have enough left to draw his breath. The goofer had got on the boat and throwed Henry that time for good and all. Miles Dougal took on mightily about losing his vimes and his nigger in the same year, and he swore that if he could get hold of that Yankee, he'd wear him to a frazzle, and then chaw up the frazzle. And he'd done it, too, for Miles Dougal's a monstrous brash man when he once gets started. He sought the vimyard out over again, but it was three, four years before the vimes got to bearing any scuppernings. When the wall broke out, Miles Dougal raised a company and went off to fight the Yankees. He say he was mighty glad that wall come, and he does want to kill a Yankee for every dollar he lost longer that grape-raising Yankee. And I spec he would have done it, too, if the Yankees hadn't spishin' something and killed him first. After the surrender, old Miss moved to town. The niggers all scattered away from the plantation, and the vineyard ain't been cultivated since. Is that story true? asked Annie doubtfully, but seriously, as the old man concluded his narrative. It's just as true as I'm a sitting here, miss. There's an easy way to prove it. I can lead the way right to Henry's grave over yonder in the plantation bearing ground. And I'll tell you what, massa, I wouldn't advise you to buy this here old vineyard, cause the goof was on it yet, and there ain't no telling when it's gonna crap out. But I thought you said all the old vines died. They did appear to die, but a few of them come out again, and is mixed in amongst the others. I ain't scared to eat the grapes, cause I knows the old vines from the new ones, but with strangers, there ain't no telling what might happen. I wouldn't advise you to buy this vineyard. I bought the vineyard, nevertheless, and it has been for a long time in a thriving condition, and is often referred to by the local press as a striking illustration of the opportunities open to northern capital in the development of southern industries. The luscious scuppernong holds first rank among our grapes, though we cultivate a great many other varieties, and our income from grapes packed and shipped to the northern markets is quite considerable. I have not noticed any developments of the goofer in the vineyard, although I have a mild suspicion that our colored assistants do not suffer from want of grapes during the season. I found when I bought the vineyard that Uncle Julius had occupied a cabin on the place for many years, and derived a respectable revenue from the product of the neglected grapevines. This doubtless accounted for his advice to me not to buy the vineyard, though whether it inspired the goofer story I am unable to state. I believe, however, that the wages I paid him for his services as coachman for I gave him employment in that capacity, were more than an equivalent for anything he lost by the sale of the vineyard. Section 2 of The Conjure Woman by Charles Waddell Chestnut Poe Sandy On the northeast corner of my vineyard, in central North Carolina, and fronting on the Lumberton Plank Road, there stood a small frame house of the simplest construction. It was built of pine lumber, and contained but one room, to which one window gave light, and one door admission. Its weather-beaten sides revealed a virgin innocence of paint. Against one end of the house, and occupying half its width, there stood a huge brick chimney. The crumbling mortar had left large cracks between the bricks. The bricks themselves had begun to scale off in large flakes, leaving the chimney sprinkled with unsightly blotches. These evidences of decay were but partially concealed by a creeping vine, which extended its slender branches hither and thither in an ambitious but futile attempt to cover the whole chimney. The wooden shutter, which had once protected the unglazed window, had fallen from its hinges, and lay rotting in the rank grass and jimson weeds beneath. This building, I learned when I bought the place, had been used as a schoolhouse for several years prior to the breaking out of the war, since which time it had remained unoccupied, save when some stray cow or vagrant hog had sought shelter within its walls from the chill rains and nipping winds of winter. One day my wife requested me to build her a new kitchen. 
the house erected by us when we first came to live upon the vineyard contained a very conveniently arranged kitchen but for some occult reason my wife wanted a kitchen in the back yard apart from the dwelling house after the usual southern fashion of course i had to build it to save expense i decided to tear down the old schoolhouse and use the lumber which was in a good state of preservation in the construction of the new kitchen before demolishing the old house however i made an estimate of the amount of material contained in it and found that i would have to buy several hundred feet of lumber additional in order to build the new kitchen according to my wife's plan one morning old julius mcadoo our colored coachman harnessed the gray mare to the rockaway and drove my wife and me over to the sawmill from which i meant to order the new lumber we drove down the long lane which led from our house to the plank road following the plank road for about a mile we turned into a road running through the forest and across the swamp to the sawmill beyond our carriage jolted over the half-rotted corduroy road which traversed the swamp and then climbed the long hill leading to the sawmill when we reached the mill the foreman had gone over to a neighboring farmhouse probably to smoke or gossip and we were compelled to await his return before we could transact our business we remained seated in the carriage a few rods from the mill and watched the leisurely movements of the mill hands we had not waited long before a huge pine log was placed in position the machinery of the mill was set in motion and the circular saw began to eat its way through the log with a loud whirr which resounded throughout the vicinity of the mill the sound rose and fell in a sort of rhythmic cadence which heard from where we sat was not unpleasing and not loud enough to prevent conversation when the saw started on its second journey through the log julius observed in a lugubrious tone and with a perceptible shudder mm, but dat just do cuddle my blood what's the matter uncle julius inquired my wife who is of a very sympathetic turn of mind. Does the noise affect your nerves? No, Miss Annie, replied the old man with emotion. I ain't nervous, but that saw a cutting and grinding through that stick of timber and moaning and groaning and sweaking cares my memories back to old times and minds me of poor Sandy. The pathetic intonation with which he lengthened out the poor Sandy touched a responsive chord in our own hearts. "'And who was poor Sandy?' asked my wife, who takes a deep interest in the stories of plantation life which she hears from the lips of the older colored people. Some of these stories are quaintly humorous, others wildly extravagant, revealing the oriental cast of the negro's imagination, while others, poured freely into the sympathetic ear of a northern-bred woman, disclose many a tragic incident of the darker side of slavery. "'Sandy,' said Julius, replying to my wife's question, "'was a nigger what used to belong to old Moss Marable McSwain. Moss Marable's place was on the other side of the swamp, right next to your place. "'Sandy was a monstrous good nigger, and could do so many things there about the plantation, and all his tend to his work so well, that when Ma's Marabo's chillins growed up and married off, they all of them wanted their daddy for to gin em Sandy for a wedding present. But Ma's Marabo knowed the rest wouldn't be satisfied if he gin Sandy to air one of em. So when they was all done mad, he fixed it by allowing one of his chillins to take Sandy for a month or so, and then another for a month or so, and so on that away till they had all had em the same length of time. And then they would all take em round again exceptin once in a while when Mars Marable would lend em to some of his other kin folks round the country when they was short of hands till by and by it got so sandy didn't hardly know where he was going to stay from one week's end to the other one time when sandy was lent out as usual a speculator come along with a lot of niggers and Mars Marable swapped sandy's wife off for a new woman when sandy come back Mars Marable gin him a dollar and loud he was monstrous sorry for the break-up of the family but the speculator had gin him big boot and times was hard and money scarce 
and so he was bleached to make a trade. Sandy took on some about losing his wife, but he soon seed they wasn't no use crying over spilt molasses, and being as he lacked the looks of the new woman, he took up with her after she'd been on the plantation a month or so. Sandy and his new wife got on mighty well together, and the niggers all minced to talk about how loving they was. When Tenny was took sick once, Sandy used to sit up all night with her, and then go to work in the morning just like he had his regular sleep, and Tenny would have done anything in the world for her Sandy. Sandy and Tenny hadn't been living together for more than two months before Mars Maribel's old uncle, who had lived down in Robeson County, sent up to find out if Mars Maribel couldn't lend him or hire him a good hand for a month or so. Sandy's master was one of these here easy-going folks would want to please everybody, and he says yes, he could lend him Sandy. And Mars Maribel told Sandy for to get ready to go down to Robeson next day for to stay a month or so. It was monstrous hard on Sandy for to take him away from Tenny. It was so fur down to Robeson that he didn't have no chance of coming back to see her till the time was up. He wouldn't a mind coming ten or fifteen mile at night to see Tenny, but Mars Maribel's uncle's plantation was more than forty mile off. Sandy was mighty sad and cast down after what Mars Maribel told him, and he says to Tenny, says he, I'm getting monstrous tired of this year going round so much. Here I is lent to Mars Jeems this month, and I got to do so and so, and to Mars Archie the next month, and I got to do so and so, then I got to go to Miss Jenny's. And it's Sandy this, and Sandy that, and Sandy yeah, and Sandy there, till it appears to me I ain't got no home, nor no master, nor no mistress, nor no nothing. I can't even keep a wife. My other old woman was sold away without my getting a chance for to tell her good-bye. And now I got to go off and leave you, Tenny. And I don't know whether I'm ever going to see you again. And no, I wish I was a tree, a stump, or a rock, or something what could stay on the plantation for a while. After Sandy got through talking, Tenny didn't say now a word, but just sat there by the fire, studying and studying. By and by, she up and says, Sandy, is I ever told you I was a conjure woman? Of course, Sandy hadn't never dreamt of nothing like that, and he made a great miration when he hear what Tenny say. By and by, Tenny went on. I ain't goofed nobody, nor done no conjure work for fifteen year or more, and when I got religion I made up my mind I wouldn't work no more goofer. But there is some things I don't believe is no sin for to do. And if you don't want to be sent round from pillar to post, and if you don't want to go down to Robeson, I can fix things so you won't have to. If you'll just say the word, I can turn you to whatever you want to be, and you can stay right where you want to, as long as you mind to. Sandy say he don't care. He's willing for to do anything for to stay close to Tenny. Then Tenny asks him if he don't want to be turned into a rabbit. Sandy say, no, nah, the dogs might get at to me. Shall I turn you to a wolf? says Tenny. Nah, everybody's scared of a wolf, and I don't want nobody to be scared of me. Shall I turn you to a mockingbird? Nah, a hawk might catch me. I want to be turned into something what'll stay in one place. I can turn you to a tree, says Tenny. You won't have no mouth nor ears, but I can turn you back once in a while so you can get something to eat and hear what's going on. Well, Sandy say that'll do. And so Tenny took him down by the edge of the swamp, not fur from the quarters, and turned him into a big pine tree and sought him out amongst some other trees. And the next morning, as some of the field hands was going long there, they see the tree what they didn't remember it having seed before. It was monstrous queer, and they was bleased to allow that they hadn't membered right, or else one of the saplings had been growing monstrous fast. When Mars Maribel discovered that Sandy was gone, he allowed Sandy had run away. He got the dogs out, but the last place they could track Sandy to was the foot of that pine tree. And there the dogs stood and barked and bayed and pawed at the tree 
and tried to climb up on it. And when they was took round through the swamp to look for the scent, they broke loose and made for that tree again. It was the beatenest thing the white folks ever heard of, and Mars Marable allowed that Sandy must have climbed up on the tree and jump off on a mule or something and rid fur enough for the sport of scent. Mars Marable wanted to cue some of the other niggers of helping Sandy off, but they all nighted to the last, and everybody knowed Tenny sot too much stole by Sandy for to help him run away while she couldn't never see him no more. When Sandy had been gone long enough for folks to think he done got clean away, Tenny used to go down to the woods at night and turn him back, and then they'd slip up to the cabin and sit by the fire and talk. But they had to be monstrous careful, or else somebody would have seed him, and that would have spoiled the whole thing. So Tenny always turned Sandy back in the morning early, before anybody was a stirring. But Sandy didn't get along without his trials and tribulations. One day a woodpecker come along and minced to peck at the tree, and the next time Sandy was turns back, he had a little round hole in his arm, just like a sharp stick been stuck in it. After that, Tenny sought a sparrowhawk for to watch the tree, and when the woodpecker come along next morning for to finish his nest, he got gobbled up most for he stuck his bill in the bark. Another time, Mars Marable sent a nigger out in the woods for to chop turpentine boxes. The man chop a box in dis here tree and hack the bark up two or three feet for to let the turpentine run. The next time Sandy was turned back, he had a big scar on his left leg, just like it been skunt. And it took Tenny nigh about all night for to fix a mixture to cure it up. After that, Tenny sought a hornet for to watch the tree, and when the nigger come back again for to cut another box on the other side of the tree, the hornet stung him so hard that the axe slipped and cut his foot nigh about off. When Tenny see so many things happening to the tree, she cluded she had to turn Sandy to something else, and after studying the matter over and talking with Sandy one evening, she made up her mind for to fix up a goofer mixture what would turn herself and Sandy to foxes, or something, so they could run away and go somewheres where they could be free and live like white folks. But there ain't no telling what's going to happen in this world. Tenny had got the night sought for her and Sandy to run away, when that very day one of Mars Marable's sons rid up to the big house in his buggy, and say his wife was monstrous sick, and he wanted his mammy to lend him a woman for to nurse his wife. Tenny's mistress say, send Tenny. She was a good nurse. Young Mars was in a terrible hurry for to get back home. Tenny was washing at the big house that day, and a mistress say she should go right along with a young massa. Tenny tried to make some excuse for to get away and hide till night, when she would have everything fixed up for her and Sandy. She say she want to go to her cabin for to get her bonnet. Her mistress say it don't matter about the bonnet. Her head hanker was good enough. Then Tenny say she want to get her best frock. Her mistress say no, she don't need no more frock, and when that one got dirty, she could get a clean one where she was going. So Tenny had to get in the buggy and go along with young Moss Duncan to his plantation, which was more than twenty mile away, and there wasn't no chance of her seeing Sandy no more till she come back home. The poor gal felt monstrous bad about the way things was going on, and she knowed Sandy must be a-wondering why she didn't come turning back no more. Whilst Tenny was away nussing young Mars Duncan's wife, Mars Marabo took a notion for to build him a new kitchen, and being as he had lots of timber on his place, he begun to look round for a tree to have the lumber sawed outen. And I don't know how it come to be so, but it happened for to hit on the very tree what Sandy was turns into. Tenny was gone and they wasn't nobody and there nothing for to watch the tree. The two men would cut the tree down say they never had such a time with a tree before. They axes would glance off, and didn't appear to make no progress through the wood. And of all the creaking and shaking and wobbling you ever see, that tree done it when it commenced to fall. It was the beatenest thing. When they got the tree all trim up, they chained it up to a timber wagon and start for the sawmill. But they had a hard time getting a log there. First they got stuck in the mud when they was going across the swamp, 
and it was two or three hours before they could get it out. When they start on again, the chain kept a coming loose, and they had to keep a stopping and a stopping for to hitch the log up again. When they commenced to climb the hill to the sawmill, the log broke loose and rolled down the hill in amongst the trees, and it took nigh about half a day more to get it hauled up to the sawmill. The next morning, after the day the tree was hauled to the sawmill, Tenny come home. When she got back to her cabin, the first thing she done was to run down to the woods and see how Sandy was getting on. When she seed the stump standing there, with the sap running out in it, and the limbs laying scattered round, she now about went out in her mind. She run to her cabin, and got a goofer mixture, and then followed the track of the timber wagon to the sawmill. She knowed Sandy couldn't live more than a minute or so if she turns him back, for he was all chopped up, so he'd have been bleached to die. But she wanted to turn him back long enough for to explain to him that she hadn't went off a purpose, and left him to be chopped down and sawed up. She didn't want Sandy to die with no hard feelings towards her. The hands at the sawmill had just got the big log on the carriage, and was starting up the saw when they seed a woman running up the hill, all out of breath, crying and going on, just like she was plumb stracted. It was Tinny. She come right into the mill, and throwed herself on the log, right in front of the saw, a hollering and crying to her Sandy to forgive her, and not to think hard of her for it wasn't no fault of hern. Then Tenny remembered the tree didn't have no years, and she was getting ready for the work of goofer mixture so as to turn Sandy back when the mill hands caught hold of her and tied her arms with a rope and fastened her to one of the posts in the sawmill. And then they started to saw up again and cut the log up into boards and scantlings right before her eyes. But it was mighty hard work, for of all the sweakin' and moanin' and groanin', that log done it whilst the saw was a-cuttin' through it. The saw was one of these here old-timey up-and-down saws, and it took longer them days to saw a log than it do now. They greased the saw, but that didn't stop the fuss. It kept right on, till finally they got the log all sawed up. When the overseer would run the sawmill come from breakfast, the hands up and tell him about the crazy woman, as they s'pose she was, what had come running in the sawmill, a hollering and going on, and tried to throw herself before the saw. And the overseer sent two or three of the hands for to take Tenny back to her master's plantation. Tenny appeared to be out in her mind for a long time, and her master had to lock her up in the smokehouse till she got over her spells. Mars Maribo was monstrous mad and it would have made your flesh crawl for to hear him cuss, cause he say the speculator what he got tenny from had fooled him by working a crazy woman off on him. Whilst tenny was locked up in the smokehouse, Mars Maribo took and hauled a lumber from the sawmill and put up his new kitchen. When tenny got quiet down so she could be allowed to go round the plantation, she up and told her master all about Sandy and the pine tree. And when Mars Maribo heard it, he lowed she was the worst distracted nigger he ever heard of. He didn't know what to do with Tenny. First he thought he'd put her in the poe house. But finally, seeing as she didn't do no harm to nobody nor nothing, but just went around moaning and groaning and shaking her head, he cluded to let her stay on the plantation and nurse the little nigger chillins when they mammies was to work in the cotton field. The new kitchen Mars Marabou built wasn't much use for it hadn't been put up long before the niggers meant to notice queer things about it. They could hear something moaning and groaning about in the kitchen in the night time, and when the wind would blow, they could hear something a hollering and sweaking like it was in great pain and suffering. And it got so after a while that it was all Mars Maribo's wife could do to get a woman to stay in the kitchen in the daytime long enough to do the cooking. And there wasn't nair nigger on the plantation what wouldn't rather take forty than to go about that kitchen after dark. That is, except in Tenny. She didn't appear to mind the haunts. She used to slip round at night and sit on the kitchen steps and lean up against the dough jam and run on to herself with some kind of foolishness what nobody couldn't make out, for Mars Maribo had threatened to send her off in the plantation if she say anything to any of the other niggers about the pine tree. 
but somehow or other the niggers found out all about it, and they all knowed the kitchen was haunted by Sandy's spirit. And by and by it got so Mars Marable's wife herself was scared to go out in the yard after dark. When it come to that, Mars Marable took and tore the kitchen down, and used the lumber for to build that old schoolhouse what you were talking about pulling down. The schoolhouse was in use, exceptin' in the daytime, and on dark nights folks going along the road would hear queer sounds and see queer things. Poor old Tenny used to go down there at night and wander around the schoolhouse, and the niggers all loud she went for to talk with Sandy's spirit. In one winter morning, when one of the boys went to school early for to start the fire, what should he find but poor old Tenny laying on the floor, stiff and cold and dead? There didn't appear to be nothing particularly the matter with her. She had just grieved herself to death for her Sandy. Mars Marabo didn't shed no tears. He thought Tenny was crazy, and they wasn't no telling what she might do next. And there ain't much room in this world for crazy white folks, let alone a crazy nigger. It wasn't long after that before Mars Marabo sold a piece of his track of land to Mars Dougal McAdoo, my old master and that's how the old schoolhouse happened to be on your place. When the wall broke out, the school stopped, and the old schoolhouse been standing empty ever since, that is, exceptin' for the haunts, and folks says that the old schoolhouse, or any other house what got any of that lumber in it what was sawed out in the tree what Sandy was turned into, is going to be haunted till the last piece of plank is rotted and crumble into dust. Annie had listened to this gruesome narrative with strained attention. What a system it was, she exclaimed, when Julius had finished, under which such things were possible. What things? I asked in amazement. Are you seriously considering the possibility of a man's being turned into a tree? Oh, no, she replied quickly. Not that. And then she murmured absently, and with a dim look in her fine eyes, poor Tenny. We ordered the lumber and returned home. That night, after we had gone to bed, and my wife had to all appearances been sound asleep for half an hour, she startled me out of an incipient doze by exclaiming suddenly, John, I don't believe I want my new kitchen built out of the lumber in that old schoolhouse. You wouldn't for a moment allow yourself, I replied with some asperity, to be influenced by that absurdly impossible yarn which Julius was spinning today. I know the story is absurd, she replied dreamily, and I am not so silly as to believe it, but I don't think I should ever be able to take any pleasure in that kitchen if it were built out of that lumber. Besides, I think the kitchen would look better and last longer if the lumber were all new. Of course, she had her way. I bought the new lumber, though not without grumbling. A week or two later, I was called away from home on business. On my return, after an absence of several days, my wife remarked to me, John, there has been a split in the Sandy Run Colored Baptist Church on the temperance question. About half the members have come out from the main body and set up for themselves. Uncle Julius is one of the seceders, and he came to me yesterday and asked if they might not hold their meetings in the old schoolhouse for the present. I hope you didn't let the old rascal have it, I returned with some warmth. I had just received a bill for the new lumber I had bought. Well, she replied, I couldn't refuse him the use of the house for so good a purpose. And I'll venture to say, I continued, that you subscribe something toward the support of the new church? She did not attempt to deny it. "'What are they going to do about the ghost?' I asked, somewhat curious to know how Julius would get around this obstacle. "'Oh,' replied Annie, "'Uncle Julius says that ghosts never disturb religious worship, but that if Sandy Spirit should happen to stray into meeting by mistake, no doubt the preaching would do it good.'" Section 3 of The Conjure Woman by Charles Waddell Chestnut Ma's Jeems Nightmare We found old Julius very useful when we moved to our new residence. He had a thorough knowledge of the neighborhood, 
was familiar with the roads and the water courses, knew the qualities of the various soils and what they would produce, and where the best hunting and fishing were to be had. He was a marvelous hand in the management of horses and dogs, with whose mental processes he manifested a greater familiarity than mere use would seem to account for, though it was doubtless due to the simplicity of a life that had kept him close to nature. Toward my tract of land and the things that were on it, the creeks, the swamps, the hills, the meadows, the stones, the trees, he maintained a peculiar personal attitude that might be called predial rather than proprietary. He had been accustomed, until long after middle life, to look upon himself as the property of another. When this relation was no longer possible, owing to the war and to his master's death and the dispersion of the family, he had been unable to break off entirely the mental habits of a lifetime, but had attached himself to the old plantation, of which he seemed to consider himself an appurtenance. We found him useful in many ways, and entertaining in others, and my wife and I took quite a fancy to him. Shortly after we became established in our home on the sand hills, Julius brought up to the house one day a colored boy of about seventeen, whom he introduced as his grandson, and for whom he solicited employment. I was not favorably impressed by the youth's appearance, quite the contrary, in fact, but mainly to please the old man I hired Tom, his name was Tom, to help about the stables, weed the garden, cut wood and bring water, and in general to make himself useful about the outdoor work of the household. My first impression of Tom proved to be correct. He turned out to be very trifling, and I was much annoyed by his laziness, his carelessness, and his apparent lack of any sense of responsibility. I kept him longer than I should, on Julius's account, hoping that he might improve, but he seemed to grow worse instead of better, and when I finally reached the limit of my patience, I discharged him. "'I am sorry, Julius,' I said to the old man. "'I should have liked to oblige you by keeping him, but I can't stand Tom any longer. He is absolutely untrustworthy.' "'Yes, sir.' Uh, replied Julius, with a deep sigh and a long shake of the head. I knows he ain't much account, and there ain't much dependence to be put on him, but I was hoping that you might make some allowance for an ignorant young nigger, sir, and give him one more chance. But I had hardened my heart. I had always been too easily imposed upon, and had suffered too much from this weakness. I determined to be firm as a rock in this instance. No, Julius. I rejoined decidedly, it is impossible. I gave him more than a fair trial, and he simply won't do. When my wife and I set out for our drive in the cool of the evening, afternoon is evening in southern parlance, one of the servants put into the rockaway two large earthenware jugs. Our drive was to be down through the swamp to the mineral spring at the foot of the sand hills beyond. The water of this spring was strongly impregnated with sulphur and iron, and, while not particularly agreeable of smell or taste, was used by us in moderation for sanitary reasons. When we reached the spring we found a man engaged in cleaning it out. In answer to an inquiry, he said that if we would wait five or ten minutes, his task would be finished, and the spring in such condition that we could fill our jugs. We might have driven on and come back by way of the spring, but there was a bad stretch of road beyond, and we concluded to remain where we were until the spring should be ready. We were in a cool and shady place. It was often necessary to wait a while in North Carolina, and our northern energy had not been entirely proof against the influences of climate and local custom. While we sat there, a man came suddenly around a turn of the road ahead of us. I recognized in him a neighbor with whom I had exchanged formal calls. He was driving a horse, apparently a high-spirited creature, possessing, so far as I could see at a glance, the marks of good temper and good breeding. The gentleman, I had heard it suggested, was slightly deficient in both. The horse was rearing and plunging, and the man was beating him furiously with a buggy whip. 
when he saw us he flushed a fiery red and as he passed held the reins with one hand at some risk to his safety lifted his hat and bowed somewhat constrainedly as the horse darted by us still panting and snorting with fear he looks as though he were ashamed of himself i observed i'm sure he ought to be exclaimed my wife indignantly i think there is no worse sin and no more disgraceful thing than cruelty i quite agree with you i assented a man what abuses his hoss is going to be hard on the folks what works for him remarked julius if young mr mclean don't mind he'll have a bad dream one these here days just like his granddaddy had way back yonder long years before the war what was it about mr mclean's dream julius i asked the man had not yet finished cleaning the spring and we might as well put in time listening to julius as in any other way we had found some of his plantation tales quite interesting mars james mclean said julius was de granddaddy of dis here gentleman what is just gone by us beating his hoss he had a big plantation and a heap of niggers mars james was a hard man and monstrous strict with his hands ever since he growed up he never appeared to have no feeling for nobody when his daddy old mars john mclean died the plantation and all the niggers fell to young mars james he had been bad enough before but it wasn't long afterwards till it got so there was no use in living at all if you had to live round Mars Jeems. His niggers was bleeds to slave from daylight to dark, while the other folks didn't have to work exceptin' from sun to sun. And they didn't get no more to eat than they oughter, and that the coarsest kind. They wasn't allowed to sing, nor dance, nor play the banjo when Mars Jeems was round the place, but Mars Jeems say he wouldn't have no such goings on said he bought his hands to work and not to play and when night come they must sleep and rest so they'd be ready to get up soon in the morning and go to work fresh and strong mars jeems didn't allow no courtin' or junes in round his plantation said he wanted his niggers to put their minds on their work and not be wasting their time with no such foolishness and he wouldn't let his hands get mad said he wasn't raising niggers but was raising cotton and whenever any of the boys and gals had meant to get sweet on one another, he'd sell one of the other of them, or send them way down in Robeson County to his other plantation, where they couldn't never see one another. If any of the niggers ever complained, they got forty. So, of course, they didn't many of them complain. But they didn't like it, just the same, and nobody couldn't blame them, for they had a hard time. Mars Jeems didn't make no allowance for natural born laziness, nor sickness, nor trouble in the mind, nor nothing. He was just going to get so much work out of every hand, or know the reason why. There was one time the niggers loud for a spell that Mars Jeems might get better. He took a liking to Mars Marable McSwain's oldest gal, Miss Libby, and used to go over there every day or every evening, and folks said they was going to get married show. Sure but it appears that Miss Libby heard about the goings-on on Mars Jean's plantation, and she just lied she couldn't trust herself with no such a man, that he might get so used to abusing his niggers that he'd miss to abuse his wife after he got used to having her around the house. So she declared she wasn't going to have nothing more to do with young Mars Jean's. The niggers was all monstrous sorry when the match was bust up, for now Mars Jean's got worse than he was before he started sweethearting. The time he used to spend courtin' Miss Libby, he put in findin' fault with the niggers. And all his bad feelings cause Miss Libby throwed him over, he appeared to try to work off on the poor niggers. Whilst Mars Jeems was courtin' Miss Libby, two of the hands on the plantation had got to set in a heap of stow by one another. One of them was named Solomon, and the other was a woman what worked in the field longer than I am. I forget that woman's name, but it don't mount to much in the tale no how. Now, whether Carl's Ma's jeans was so took up with his own Junesy, footnote, sweetheart, end footnote, that it didn't pay no attention for a while to what was going on twixt Solomon and his Junesy, 
or whether his own cotton made him kind of easy on the cotton in the quarters, there ain't no tellin'. But there is one thing sure, that when Miss Libby throwed him over, he found out about Solomon and the gal monstrous quick, and gun Solomon forty, and sent the gal down to the Robeson County plantation, and told all the niggers if he catch him at any more such foolishness, he was going to skin em alive and tan they hides before they very eyes. Cause he wouldn't have done it, but it might have made things worse than they was. So you can imagine they wasn't much love-making in the quarters for a long time. Miles Jeems used to go down to the other plantations sometimes for a week or more, and so he had to hire an overseer to look after his work while he's gone. Miles Jeems' overseer was a poor white man named Nick Johnson. The niggers called him Miles Johnson to his face, but behind his back they used to call him Old Nick, and the name suited him to a T. He was worse than Miles Jeems ever dared to be. Of course, the darkies didn't like the way Miles Jeems used him, but he was the master, and had a right to do as he pleased. But this here Old Nick wasn't nothing but a poor buckra and all the niggers spised him as much as they hated him, for he didn't own nobody, and wasn't no better than a nigger, for in them days any spectable person would rather be a nigger than a poor white man. Now after Solomon's gal had been sent away, he kept feeling more and more bad about it, till finally he allowed he was going to see if they couldn't be something done for to get her back, and to make Ma's Jeems treat the darkies better. So he took a peck of cotton out the barn one night, and went over to see old Aunt Peggy, the free nigger Cajun woman down by the Wilmington Road. Aunt Peggy listened to his tale, and asked him some questions, and then told him she would work her roots and see what they say about it, and tomorrow night he should come back again and fetch another peck of corn, and then she'd have something for to tell him. So Solomon went back the next night, and sure enough Aunt Peggy told him what to do, she gun him some stuff what looked like it had been made by pounding up some roots and yerbs with a pestle and a mortar. This here stuff, says she, is monstrous powerful kind of goofer. You take this home and get it to the cook, if you can trust her, and tell her for to put it in your master's soup the first cloudy day he have okra soup for dinner. Mind you follow the directions. It ain't going to poison him, is it? Solomon getting kind of scared. For Solomon was a good man, didn't want to do nobody no real harm. Oh, no, says old Aunt Peggy, it's going to do him good, but he'll have a monstrous bad dream first. A month from now, you come down here and let me know how the goofer is working, for I ain't done much of this kind of conjuring of late years, and I has to kind of keep track on it to see that it don't accomplish no more than I allows for it to do. And I has to be kind of careful about conjuring white folks, so be sure and let me know whatever you do, just what is going on around the plantation. So Solomon say all right, and took the goofer mixture up to the big house, and gun it to the cook, and told her for to put it in Ma's Jeems soup the first cloudy day she have okra soup for dinner. It happened that the very next day was a cloudy day, and so the cook made okra soup for Ma's Jeems dinner, and put the powder Solomon gunner into the soup, and made the soup real good. So Mars Jeems did a whole lot of it, and appeared to enjoy it. The next morning, Mars Jeems told the overseer he was going away on some business, and then he was going to his other plantation down in Robeson County, and he didn't expect he'd be back for a month or so. But, says he, I want you to run this here plantation for all it's worth. These here niggers is getting monstrous trifling and lazy and careless, and there ain't no dependence to be put in them. I wants that stop, and while I'm gone away, I wants the spences cut way down and a heap more work done. Fact, I want this here plantation to make a record that'll show what kind of overseer you is. Old Nick didn't say nothing but yes, sir, but the way he kind of grinned to himself and showed his big yellow teeth and snapped a rawhide he used to carry around with him made cold chills run up and down the backbone of them niggers would hear Mars Jeems a-talkin'. And that night they was moanin' and groanin' down in the quarters, for the niggers all know what was comin'. So, sure enough, Mars Jeems went away next mornin', and the trouble begun. 
Mars Johnson started off the very first day for to see what he could have to show Mars James when he come back. He made the task bigger and the rations littler, and when the niggers had worked all day, he'd find something for to do round the barn or somewhere's after dark for to keep em busy a hour or so before they went to sleep. About three or four days after Mars James went away, young Mars Duncan McSwain rode up to the big house one day with a nigger sitting behind him in the buggy, tied to the seat, and asked if Mars James was home. Mars Johnson was at the house, and he say no. Well, says Mars Duncan, says he, I fotched this nigger over to Mr. McLean for to pay a bet I made with him last week when we was playing cards together. I bet him a nigger man, and here's one I reckon will fill the bill. He was took up the other day for a stray nigger, and he couldn't give no count of hisself, and so he was sold at auction, and I bought him. He's kind of brash, but I knows your powers, Mr. Johnson, and I reckon if anybody can make him toe the mark, you is the man. Mars Johnson grinned one of them grins which show all his snagger teeth, and make the niggers lie he looked like the old Deborah, and says he to Mars Duncan, I reckon you can trust me, Mr. Duncan, for to tame any nigger was ever born. The nigger don't live what I can't take down in about four days. Well, old Nick had his hands full longer that new nigger, and whilst the rest of the darkies was sorry for the poor man, they allowed he kept Mars Johnson so busy that they got along better than they'd a done if the new nigger had never come. The first thing that happened, Mars Johnson says to this year new man, What's your name, Sambo? My name ain't Sambo, spawned the new nigger. Did I ask you what your name wasn't? says Mars Johnson. You wants to be particular how you talks to me. Now what is your name, and where did you come from? I don't know my name, says the nigger, and I don't remember where I come from. My head is all kind of mixed up. Yes, says Miles Johnson, I reckon I'll have to give you something for to clear your head. At the same time, it'll learn you some manners, and after this, maybe you'll say sir when you speaks to me. Well, Miles Johnson haul off with his rawhide and hit the new nigger once. The new man look at Miles Johnson for a minute as if he didn't know what to make of this here kind of learning. But when the overseer raised his whip to hit him again, the new nigger just haul off and made for Marsa Johnson, and if some of the other niggers hadn't stopped him, it appears as if it might have made it warm for old Nick there for a while. But the overseer made the other niggers help tie the new nigger up, and then gun him forty with a dozen or so throwed in for good measure, for old Nick was never stingy with them kind of rations. The nigger went on at a terrible rate, just like a wild man, but cause he was pleased to take his medicine but he was tied up and couldn't help himself. Master Johnson locked the new nigger up in the barn and didn't give him nothing to eat for a day or so till he got him kind of quiet down. And then he turned him loose and put him to work. The nigger lied he wasn't used to working and wouldn't work. And Miles Johnson got him another forty for laziness and impotence and let him fast a day or so more and then put him to work again. The nigger went to work, but didn't pay to know how to handle a hoe. It took just about half the overseer's time looking at them, and that poor nigger got more lashings and cussings and cuffings than any four others on the plantation. He didn't mix with nor talk much to the rest of the niggers, and couldn't pay to get it through his mind that he was a slave, and had to work and mind the white folks, spite of the fact that old Nick gun him a lesson every day. And finally, Mars Johnson lied that he couldn't do nothing with him, that if he was his nigger, he'd break his spit or break his neck, one or the other. Because he was only sawn over on trial, and as he didn't give satisfaction, and he hadn't heard from Mars Jeans about when he was coming back, and as he was feared he'd get mad some time or another and kill a nigger before he knowed it, he lied he'd better send him back where he come from. So he tied him up and sawn him back to Mars Duncan. Now, Mars Duncan McSwain was one of these here easy-going gentlemen what didn't like to hate no trouble with niggers or nobody else, and he knowed if Mars old Nick couldn't get along with his nigger, nobody could. So he took the nigger to town that same day 
and sold em to a trader what was getting up a gang of lackly niggers for to ship off on the steamboat to go down the river to Wimbledon, and from there to New Orleans. The next day, after the new man had been sent away, Solomon was working in the cotton field, and when he got to the fence next to the woods, at the end of the row, who should he see on the other side but old Aunt Peggy? She beckoned to him, the overseer was down on the other side of the field, and says she, why ain't you done come and pulled it to me like I told you? Why, law, Aunt Peggy, says Solomon, there ain't nothing to pot. Ma's James went away day after we gun him the goofer mixtry, and we ain't seen hide nor hair on him since. And course we don't know nothing about what feck you had on him. I don't care nothing about your Ma's James now. What I wants to know is what has been going on amongst the niggers. Has you been getting along any better on the plantation? No, Aunt Peggy, we been getting along worse. Mars Johnson is stricter than he ever was before, and the poor niggers don't hardly get time to draw their breath, and they lows they might just as well be dead as alive. Uh huh, says Aunt Peggy, says she. I told you that is monstrous powerful goofer, and its work don't pay all at once. Long as we had that new nigger here, Solomon went on. He kept Master Johnson busy part of the time. But now he's gone away, I suppose the rest of us will catch it worse than ever. What's gone with the new nigger? says Aunt Peggy, real quick, batting her eyes and straightening up. Old Nick done sent him back to Mars Duncan, who had fought him here for to pay a gambling debt to Mars Jeems, says Solomon. And I hear Mars Duncan has sold him to a nigger trader up in Patesville, what's going to ship him off with a gang tomorrow. Old Aunt Peggy appeared to get rail stared up when Solomon told her that, and says she, shaking a stick at him. Why didn't you come and tell me about this new nigger being sold away? Didn't you promise me if I give you that goofer, you'd come and poked me about all what's going on on this plantation? Course I could have found out for myself, but I pended on your telling me, and now by not doing it, I's feared you're going to spoil my conjun. You come down to my house tonight and do what I tells you, or I'll put a spell on you that'll make your hair fall out so you'll be bald, and your eyes drop out so you can't see, and your teeth fall out so you can't eat, and your ears grow up so you can't hear. When you was fooling with a conjure woman like me, you got to mind your P's and Q's, or there'll be trouble sure enough. So, course, Solomon went down to Aunt Piggy's that night, and she got him a roasted sweet and tater. You take this here sweet and tater, says she. I done goofed it specially for that nigger, so you bet not eat it yourself or you wish you hadn't. And slip off to town and find that strange man and give him this here sweet and tater. He must eat it before morning show, if it don't want to be sold away to New Orleans. But supposing the patter rollers catch me, Aunt Peggy, what are going to do? says Solomon. The patterollers ain't going to tetch you, but if you don't find that nigger, I'm going to get you, and you'll find me worse than the patterollers. Just hold on a minute, and I'll sprinkle you with some of this mixture out in this year bottle, so the patterollers can't see you. And you can rub your feet with some of this here grease out in this gourd, so you can run fast, and rub some of it in your eyes, so you can see in the dark. And then you must find that new nigger, and give him this here tater, or you're going to have more trouble on your hands than you ever had before in your life, or ever will have since. So Solomon took the sweet and tater, and started up the road fast as he could go, and before long he reached town. He went right along by the patter rollers, and they didn't pay to notice him. And by and by he found where the strange nigger was kept, and he walked right past the guard at the door and found him. The nigger couldn't see him, of course, and he couldn't have seen the nigger in the dark if it hadn't been for the stuff Aunt Peggy gun him to rub on his eyes. The nigger was laying in a conda, sleep, and Solomon just slipped up to him and hit that sweet and tater for the nigger's nose, and he just naturally retched up with his hand and took the tater and eat it in his sleep without knowing it. When Solomon seed he done eat the tater, he went back and told Aunt Peggy and then went home to his cabin to sleep, way along about two o'clock in the morning. 
The next day was Sunday, and so the niggers had a little time to themselves. Solomon was kind of stubbed in his mind, thinking about his Junesy what is going away, and wondering what Aunt Peggy had to do with that new nigger. And he had sauntered up in the woods so's to be by himself a little, and at the same time to look at the rabbit trap he'd sot down in the edge of the swamp, when who should he see standing under a tree but a white man? Solomon didn't know the white man at first, till the white man spoke up to him. "'Is that you, Solomon?' says he. Then Solomon recognized the voice. "'For the law's sake, Master James, is that you?' "'Yes, Solomon,' says his master. "'This is me, or uh, what's left of me.' It wasn't no wonder Solomon hadn't known Mars James at first, for he was dressed like a poor white man, and was barefooted and looked monstrous pale and peaked, as if he'd just come through a hard spell of sickness. "'You were looking kind of poly, Mars James,' says Solomon. "'Is you been sick, sir?' "'No, Solomon,' says Mars James, shaking his head and speaking sort of slow and sad. "'I ain't been sick.' but I's had a monstrous bad dream. Fact, a regular natural nightmare. But tell me how things has been going up to the plantation since I've been gone, Solomon. So Solomon up and told him about the crops and about the horses and the mules and about the cows and the hogs, and when he meant to tell him about the new nigger, Mars Jeans prick up his ears and listen, and every now and then he say, Uh-huh, mm-hmm and nod his head. And by and by, when he'd asked Solomon some more questions, he says, says he, Now, Solomon, I don't want you to say a word to nobody about meeting me here, but I want you to slip up to the house and fetch me some clothes and some shoes. I forgot to tell you that a man robbed me back yonder on the road and swapped clothes with me without asking me whether or no. But you need to say nothing about that nother. You go and fetch me some clothes here. Yeah? so nobody won't see you, and keep your mouth shut, and I'll give you a dollar. Solomon was so astonished he lacked a fell over in his tracks when Mars James promised to give him a dollar. They certainly was a change come over Mars James when he offered one of his niggers that much money. Solomon meant to expect that Aunt Peggy's conjation had been working monstrous strong. Solomon fetched Mars James some clothes and shoes, and that same evening, Mars James peered at the house and let on like he just that minute got home from Robeson County. Mars Johnson was all ready to talk to him, but Mars James saw him word he wasn't feeling very well that night, and he'd see him tomorrow. So next morning, after breakfast, Mars James sent for the overseer and asked him for to give county his stewardship. Old Nick told Mars James how much work been done and got the books and showed him how much money been saved. Then Mars James asked him how the darkies been behaving, and Mars Johnson say they been behaving good, most of them, and then what didn't behave good at first changed their conduct after he got holt of them a time or two. All, says he, exceptin' the new nigger Mr. Duncan fought over here and left on trial while you was gone. Ah, yes, lows Mars James. Tell me all about that new nigger. I heard a little about that queer new nigger last night, and it was just too ridiculous. Tell me all about that new nigger. So, seeing Mars Jeems so good-natured about it, Mars Johnson up and told him how he tied up the new hand the first day, and gun him forty cause he wouldn't tell him his name. Ha, 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 says Mars Jeems, laughing fit to kill. But that is too funny for any use. Tell me some more about that new nigger. So Mars Johnson went on and told him how he had to starve the new nigger for he could make him take hold of a hoe. That was the beatin'est notion for a nigger, says Mars James, putting on airs just like he was a white man. And I reckon you didn't do nothing to him. Oh, no, sir, says the overseer, grinning like a cheesy cat. I didn't do nothing but take the hide off of him. Mars James laughed and laughed till it peared like he was going to bust. Tell me some more about that new nigger. Oh, tell me some more. That new nigger interests me, he do, and that is a fact. Mars Johnson didn't quite understand why Mars Jeems should make such a great miration about the new nigger, but cause he want to please the gentleman would hide him, 
and so he splained on about how many times he had to cowhide a new nigger and how he made him do tasks twice as big as some of the other hands and how he'd chain him up in the barn at night and feed him on corn bread and water oh but you was a monstrous good overseer you was the best overseer in this county mr johnson says mars james when the overseer got through with his tale and they ain't never been no nigger breaker like you round here before and you deserves great credit for sending that nigger away before you spilt him for the market fact you was such a monstrous good overseer and you has got this here plantation in such fine shape that i reckon i don't need you no mo you has got these here darkies so well trained that i spec i can run em myself from this time on but i does wish you had a hilt on to that new nigger till i got home for i'd a like to see them i certainly should the overseer was so astonished he didn't hardly know what to say but finally he asked mars jeems if he wouldn't give him a recommend for to get him another place no sir says mars jeems somehow or another i don't like your look since i come back this time and i'd much rather you wouldn't stay round here fact i's feared if i'd meet you alone in the woods some time i might want to harm you but laying that aside i been looking over these here books of yon what you kept while i was away and for a year or so back and there's some figures what ain't just clear to me i ain't got no time for to talk about em now but i spect before i settles with you for this last month you better come up here to ma after i has looked the books and counts over some more and then we'll straighten our business all up mars jeems loud afterwards that he was just shooting in the dark when he said that about the books but howsomever mars nick johnson left that neighborhood twixt the next two sons and nobody round here never seed hiding a hair em since and all the darkies tanked the lord and loud it was a good riddance of bad rubbage but all them things i done told you ain't nothing sidin to change what come over mars jeems from that time on aunt peggy's goopher had made a new man of him entirely the next day after he come back he told her hands they nin to work only from sun to sun and he cut they tasks down so they didn't nobody had to stand over em with a raw hide or a hickory and he lowed if the niggers want to have a dance in the big barn any saturday night they might have it and by and by when solomon seed how good mars jeems was he asked him if he wouldn't please send down to the other plantation for his junesy mars jeems say suddenly and gun solomon a pass and a note to the overseer on the other plantation and sent solomon down to robeson county with a horse and buggy for to fetch his junesy back when the niggers see how fine mars jeems goin treat em they all took to sweethearting and junesying and singin and dancin and eight or ten couples got mad and by and by everybody meant to say mars jeems mclean got a finer plantation and slicker looking niggers and that he is making mo cotton and corn than any other gentleman in the county and mars jeems own junesy miss libby heard about the new goings on on mars jeems plantation and she changed her mind about mars jeems and took him back again and fo long they had a fine wedding and all the darkies had a big feast and they was fiddlin and dancin and funnin and frolickin from sundown to mornin and they all lived happy ever after i said as the old man reached a full stop yes sir he said interpreting my remarks as a question they did solomon used to say he added that aunt peggy's goopher had turned mars jeems to a nigger and that that new hand was mars jeems hisself but cause solomon didn't dast to let on bout what he spishin and old aunt peggy would a knighted if she had been axed for she'd a gotten trouble sho if it is knowed she'd been conjurin to white folks this here tale goes to show concluded julius sententiously as the man came up and announced that the spring was ready for us to get water that white folks what is so hard and strict and don't make no allowance for poor ignorant niggers what ain't had no chance to learn is liable to have bad dreams to say the least and that dem what is kind and good to poor people is sure to prosper and get long in the world that is a very strange story uncle julius observed my wife smiling and solomon's explanation is quite improbable yes julius said i 
that was powerful goopher i am glad too that you told us the moral of the story it might have escaped us otherwise by the way did you make that up all by yourself the old man's face assumed an injured look expressive more of sorrow than of anger and shaking his head he replied no sir i heard that tale before you or miss annie there was born sir my mammy told me that tale when i wasn't more than knee-high to a hopper grass i drove to town next morning on some business and did not return until noon and after dinner i had to visit a neighbor and did not get back until supper time i was smoking a cigar on the back piazza in the early evening when i saw a familiar figure carrying a bucket of water to the barn i called my wife my dear i said severely what is that rascal doing here i thought i discharged him yesterday for good and all oh yes she answered i forgot to tell you he was hanging round the place all the morning and looking so down in the mouth that i told him that if he would try to do better we would give him one more chance he seemed so grateful and so really in earnest in his promises of amendment that i'm sure you'll not regret taking him back i was seriously enough annoyed to let my cigar go out i did not share my wife's rose-colored hopes in regard to tom but as i did not wish the servants to think there was any conflict of authority in the household i let the boy stay section four of the conjure woman by charles waddell chestnut the conjurer's revenge sunday was sometimes a rather dull day at our place in the morning when the weather was pleasant my wife and i would drive to town a distance of about five miles to attend the church of our choice the afternoons we spent at home for the most part occupying ourselves with the newspapers and magazines and the contents of a fairly good library we had a piano in the house on which my wife played with skill and feeling i possessed a passable baritone voice and could accompany myself indifferently well when my wife was not by to assist me when these resources failed us we were apt to find it a little dull one sunday afternoon in early spring the balmy spring of north carolina when the air is in that ideal balance between heat and cold where one wishes it could always remain my wife and i were seated on the front piazza she wearily but conscientiously ploughing through a missionary report while i followed the impossible career of the blonde heroine of a rudimentary novel i had thrown the book aside in disgust when I saw Julius coming through the yard, under the spreading elms which were already in full leaf. He wore his Sunday clothes, and advanced with a dignity of movement quite different from his weekday slouch. "'Have a seat, Julius,' I said, pointing to an empty rocking chair. "'No, nah, thank you, boss. I'll just sit here on the top step.' "'Oh, no, Uncle Julius,' exclaimed Annie. "'Take this chair.' you will find it much more comfortable the old man grinned in appreciation of her solicitude and seated himself somewhat awkwardly julius i remarked i am thinking of setting out scuppernong vines on that sand hill where the three persimmon trees are and while i'm working there i think i'll plant watermelons between the vines and get a little something to pay for my first year's work the new railroad will be finished by the middle of summer and I can ship the melons north, and get a good price for them. "'If you're going to have any more plowing to do,' replied Julius, "'I spect you'll have to buy another creature, "'cause it's much as them horses can do to tend to the work they got now.' "'Yes, I had thought of that. "'I think I'll get a mule. "'A mule can do more work, and doesn't require as much attention as a horse.' "'I wouldn't advise you to buy no mule.' remarked julius with a shake of his head why not well you may allow it's all foolishness but if i was in your place i wouldn't buy no mule but that isn't a reason what objection have you to a mule fact is 
continued the old man in a serious tone. I don't like to drive a mule. I was always feared I might be imposing on some human creature. Every time I cuts a mule with a hickory, pears to me most likely I was cutting some of my own relations, or uh, somebody else what can't help themselves. What put such an absurd idea into your head? I asked. My question was followed by a short silence, during which Julia seemed engaged in a mental struggle. I don't know as it's worth while to tell you this, he said at length. I don't hardly expect for you to believe it. Does you remember that club-footed man would help the horse for you the other day, when you was getting out of the rockaway down to Mars Archie McMillan's stow? Yes, I believe I do remember seeing a club-footed man there. Did you ever see a club-footed nigger before or since? No, I can't remember that I ever saw a club-footed colored man, I replied after a moment's reflection. You and Miss Annie wouldn't want to believe me if I was to allow that that man was once a mule. No, I replied, I don't think it very likely that you could make us believe it. Why, Uncle Julius, said Annie severely, what ridiculous nonsense! This reception of the old man's statement reduced him to silence, and it required some diplomacy on my part to induce him to vouchsafe an explanation. The prospect of a long, dull afternoon was not alluring, and I was glad to have the monotony of Sabbath quite relieved by a plantation legend. When I was a young man, began Julius, when I had finally prevailed upon him to tell us the story, that club-footed nigger, his name is Primus, used to belong to old Mas Jim McGee over on the Lumberton Plank Road. I used to go over there to see a woman what lived on the plantation. That's how I come to know all about it. This year Primus was the liveliest hand on the place, all as a dancing and drinking and running round and singing and picking the banjo, excepting once in a while when he'd allow he wasn't treated right about something or another. He'd get so sulky and stubborn that the white folks couldn't hardly do nothing with him. It was getting the rules for any of the hands to go away from the plantation at night, but Primus didn't mind the rules and went when he felt like it. And the white folks pretend like they didn't know it, for Primus was dangerous when he got in them stubborn spells, and they'd rather not fool with him. One night, in the spring of the year, Primus slipped off from the plantation and went down on the Wimbledon Road to a dance gun by some of the free niggers down there. There was a fiddle and a banjo and a jug going round on the outside, and Primus sung and danced till long about two o'clock in the morning, when he stopped for home. As he come along back, he took a nigh cut across the cotton fields and long by the edge of the Minra Spring Swamp, so as to get shut of the patter rollers would rid up and down the big road for to keep the dockies from running round nights. Primus was saunting long studying about the good time he'd had with the gals, when as he was gone by a fence conder, what should he hear but something grunt? He stopped a minute to listen, and he heard something grunt again. Then he went over to the fence where he heard the fuss, and there laying in the fence conder on a pile of pine straw, he seed a fine, fat shoat. Primus looked hard at the shoat, and then started home. But somehow or other, he couldn't get away from that shoat. When he took one step forwards with one foot, the other foot appeared to take two steps backwards, and so he kept naturally getting closer and closer to the shoat. It was the beatinest thing. The shoat just appeared to charm Primus, and first thing you know, Primus found himself way up the road with the shoat on his back. If Primus had a knowed who shoat that was, he'd a managed to get past it somehow or another. As it happened, the shoat belonged to a conjure man what lived down in the free nigger sediment. Cause the conjure man didn't have to work his roots but a little while before he found out who took his shoat, and then the trouble begun. One morning, a day or so later, and before he got the shoat eat up, Primus didn't go to work when the horn blow, and when the overseer went to look for him, there wasn't no trace of Primus to be discovered nowhere. When he didn't come back in a day or so more, everybody on the plantation allowed he'd run away. His master advertised him in the papers and offered a big reward for him. 
de nigger catches fotch out de dogs and track em down to de edge of de swamp and then the scent gun out and that was the last anybody see the premise for a long long time two or three weeks after primus disappear his master went to town one sunday mas jim was standing in front of sandy campbell's bar room up by the old wagon yard when a poor white man from down on the wimbledon road come up to him and asked him kind of careless like if he didn't want to buy a mule i don't know says mas jim it depends on the mule and on the price where's the mule just round here back of old tom mckellis's stove says the poor white man i reckon i'll have a look at the mule says mas jim and if it suit me i don't know but what i might buy him so the poor white man took mas jim round back of the stove and there stood a monstrous fine mule when the mule see mas jim he gonna whinny just like he knowed him before Mars Jim look at the mule, and the mule peared to be sound and strong. Mars Jim loud they peared to be something familiar about the mule's face, especially his eyes. But he hadn't lost near a mule, and didn't have no remembrance of having seen the mule before. He asked the pole bucker where he got the mule, and the pole bucker say his bruh raised the mule down on Rockfish Creek. Mars Jim was a little suspicious of seeing a pole white man with such a fine creature but he finally agreed to give the man fifty dollars for the mule, about half what a good mule was worth them days. He tied the mule behind the buggy when he went home, and put him to plowing cotton the next day. The mule done mighty well for three or four days, and then the niggers meant to notice some queer things about him. There was a meadow on the plantation where they used to put the horses and mules to pasture. It was fenced off from the cornfield on one side, but on the other side of the pasture was a tobacco patch where it wasn't fenced off, cause the beastesses done none of them eat tobacco. They don't know what's good. Tobacco is like religion. The good Lord made it for people, and they ain't no other creature what can appreciate it. The doctors noticed that the first thing the new mule done, when he was turned into the pasture, was to make for the tobacco patch. Cause they didn't think nothing on it, but next morning, when they went to catch him, they discovered that he'd eat up two whole rows of tobacco plants. After that, they had to put a halt on him and tie him to a stake, or else they wouldn't have been near a leaf of tobacco left in the patch. Another day, one of the hands named Dolphus hitched a mule up and drive up here to the vineyard. That was when old Mars Dougal owned this place. Mars Dougal had killed a yearling, and the neighbor white folks all sauntered over for to get some fresh meat and Mars Jim had sent Dolphus for some, too. There was a wine press in the yard where Dolphus left the mule standing, and right in front of the press there was a tub of grape juice, just pressed out, and a little to one side a barrel about half full of wine where it had been standing two or three days, and had begun to get sort of sharp to the taste. There was a couple of boards on top of this here barrel with a rock laid on them to hold them down. As I was saying, Dolphus left the mule standing in the yard and went into the smokehouse for to get the beef. By and by, when he come out, he seed the mule was staggering about the yard, and fo' Dolphus could get there to find out what was the matter, the mule fell right over on his side and lay there just like he was dead. All the niggers about the house run out there for to see what was the matter. Some say the mule had the colic, some say one thing and some another till by and by one of the hands seed the top was off of the barrel and run and looked in fo the lord he say that mule drunk he been drinking the wine and show sure enough the mule had passed right by the tub of fresh grape juice and pushed a cover off in the barrel and drunk two or three gallons of the wine would have been standing long enough for to begin to get sharp the darkies all made a great miration about the mule getting drunk they never hadn't seen nothing like it in they born days. They poured water over the mule and tried to sober him up, but it wasn't no use, and Dolphus had to take the beef home on his back and leave the mule there till he slept off his spree. I don't remember whether I told you or not, but when Primus disappeared from the plantation, he left a wife behind him, a monstrous good-looking yellow gal named Sally. When Primus had been gone a month or so, 
Sally meant for to get lonesome and took up with another young man named Dan, what belonged on the same plantation. One day this year Dan took the new mule out in the cotton field for the plow, and when they was gone long the turn row, who should he meet but this here Sally? Dan looked round and he didn't see the overseer nowhere, so he stopped a minute for to run on with Sally. How there, honey, says he, how you feeling this morning? First rate, spun Sally. They was looking at one another, and they didn't dare one of em pay no attention to the mule who had turned his head round and was looking at Sally as hard as he could, and stretching his neck and raising his ears and whining kind of soft to herself. Yes, honey, lies Dan, and you gonna feel first rate long as you sticks to me. For I's a better man than that low down runaway nigger primus that you've been wasting your time with. Dan had let go the plow hander, and had put his arm round Sally, and was just going to kiss her, when something catch him by the scruff of the neck, and flung him way over in the cotton patch. When he picked himself up, Sally had gone kitten down the turn row, and the mule was standing there looking as calm and peaceful as a sunny morning. First, Dan had lowed it was the overseer what had caught him wasting his time, but there wasn't no overseer in sight so he clued it must have been the mule. So he pitched into the mule and lammed him as hard as he could. The mule took it all, and appeared to be as humble as a mule could be. But when they was making the turn at the end of the row, one of the plow lines got under the mule's hind leg. Dan reached down to get the line out, sort of careless-like, when the mule hauled off and kicked him clean over the fence into a briar patch on the other side. Dan was mighty so from his wounds and scratches, and was laid up for two or three days. One night the new mule got out in the pasture and went down to the quarters. Dan was laying there on his pallet when he heard something banging away at the side of his cabin. He raised up on one shoulder and looked round when what should he see but the new mule's head sticking in the window, with his lips drawn back over his tooths, grinning and snapping at Dan just like he want to eat him up. Then the mule went round to the dough and kicked away like he want to break the dough down to by and by somebody come along and drive him back to the pasture. When Sally come in a little later from the big house where she'd been waiting on the white folks, she found Poe Dan nigh about dead. He was so scared. She allowed Dan had had a nightmare, for when they look at the dough, they see the marks of the mule's huffs, so there couldn't be no mistake about what had happened. Cost the niggers told a master about the mule's goings on. First he didn't pay no attention to it, but after a while he told them if they didn't stop their foolishness, he gon' tie some of them up. So after that, they didn't say nothing more to their master. But they kept on noticing the mule's queer ways just the same. Long about the middle of the summer, there was a big camp meeting broke out down on the Wilmington Road, and nigh about all the poor white folks and free niggers in the settlement got religion. And lo and behold, amongst them was the conjure man who owned the shoat with charm primus. This conjure man was a guinea nigger, and before he was sought free, had used to belong to a gentleman down in Sampson County. The conjure man say his daddy was a king, a governor, or some sort of what you call him, way over yonder in Africa, where the niggers come from, before he was stowed away and sold to the speculators. The conjure man had helped his mouse out in some trouble or another with his goofer, and his master had set him free, and bought him a track of land down on the Wilmington Road. He pretended to be a cow doctor, but everybody knowed what it really was. The conjure man hadn't mowed and come through good before it was took sick with a cold what he caught kneeling on the ground so long at the mourner's bench. It kept getting worse and worse, and by and by the rheumatiz took hold of him, and drawed him all up. So one day he sent word up to Mars Jim McGee's plantation, and asked Pete, the nigger what took care of the mules, for to come down there that night and fetch that mule what his master had bought from the poor white man during the summer. Pete didn't know what the conjure man was driving at, but he didn't dare to stay away. And so that night, when he'd done eat his bacon and his hoe cake, and drunk his molasses and water, he put a bridle on the mule and rid him down to the conjure man's cabin. When he got to the dough, he lit and hitched the mule, 
and then knocks at the door. He felt mighty jubous about going in, but he was obliged to do it. He knowed he couldn't help himself. Pull the string, says a weak voice, and when Pete lifted the latch and went in, the conjure man was laying on the bed, looking pale and weak, like he didn't have much longer for to live. Is you fetched a mule? says he. Pete say yes, and the conjure man kept on. Brer Pete, says he, I's been a monstrous sinner man, and I's done a pile wickedness in doing it in my days. But the good Lord has washed my sins away, and I feels now that I's bound for the kingdom. And I feels, too, that I ain't going to get up from this bed no more in this well, and I wants to undo some of the harm I done. And that's the reason, Bra Pete, I sent for you to fetch that mule down here. You remember that shoat I was up to your plantation quiet about last June? Yes, says Bra Pete. I remember your axing about a shoat you had lost. I don't know whether you ever learned it or no, says the conjure man. But I done knowed your master's premise that took the shoat, and I was bound to get even with him. So one night I caught him down by the swamp on his way to a candy pulling, and I throwed a goofer mixture on him and turned him to a mule, and got a poor white man to sell the mule, and we'd have added the money. But I don't want to die till I turn bro Primus back again. Then the conjure man asked Pete to take down one or two gauds off in the shelf in the corner, and one or two bottles with some kind of mixture in them, and set them on a stool by the bed, and then he asked him to fetch the mule in. When the mule come in the door, he gin a snort and started for the bed, just like he was going to jump on it. Hold on there, bro Primus, the conjure man hollered. I's monstrous weak, and if you commence on me, you won't never have no chance for to get turned back no more. The mule see the sense of that and stood still. Then the conjure man took the gods and bottles and minced to work the roots and yerbs and the mule meant to turn back to a man. First his ears, then the rest of his head, then his shoulders and arms. All the time the conjure man kept on working his roots, and Pete and Primus could see he was getting weaker and weaker all the time. Brother Pete, says he by and by, give me a drink of them bitters out in that green bottle on the shelf yonder. I's gone fast, and it'll give me strength for to finish this work. Bra Pete look up on the mantelpiece, and he see the bottle in the corner. It was so dark in the cabin he couldn't tell whether it was a green bottle or no. But he hilt the bottle to the conjure man's mouth, and it took a big mouthful. He hadn't more than swallowed it before he meant to holler. You give me the wrong bottle, Bra Pete. This here bottle's got pizen in it, and I's done for this time, show. Sure. Hold me up for the Lord's sake, till I get through turning Bra Primus back. So Pete held him up, and he kept on working the roots, till he got the goofer all took off in Bro Primus, except in one foot. He hadn't got this foot more than half turned back before his strength gun out entirely, and he dropped the roots and fell back on the bed. I can't do no more for you, Bro Primus, says he, but I hope you will forgive me for what harm I done you. I knows the good Lord done forgive me, and I hope to meet you both in glory. I sees the good angels waiting for me up yonder with a long white robe and a starry crown, and I'm on my way to join them. And so the conjure man died, and Pete and Primus went back to the plantation. The dockies all made a great miration when Primus come back. Mars Jim let on like he didn't believe the tale the two niggers told. He says Primus had run away, and stayed till he got tired of the swamps, and then come back on him to be fed. He tried to account for the shape of Primus's foot by saying Primus got his foot smashed, a snake bit or something, whilst he was away, and then stayed out in the woods where he couldn't get it cured up straight, instead of coming long home where a doctor could attend to it. But the niggers all noticed the master didn't tie Primus up, nor take on much cause the mule was gone. So they lied their master must have had suspicions about that conjure man. 
my wife had listened to Julius's recital with only a mild interest. When the old man had finished it, she remarked, "'That story does not appeal to me, Uncle Julius, and is not up to your usual mark. It isn't pathetic. It has no moral that I can discover, and I can't see why you should tell it. In fact, it seems to me like nonsense.' The old man looked puzzled as well as pained. He had not pleased the lady, and he did not seem to understand why. "'I'm sorry, ma'am,' he said reproachfully, "'if you don't like that tale. I can't make out what you means by some of them words you uses, but I'm telling nothing but the truth. Course I didn't see the conjure man turn him back, if I wasn't there. But I've been hearing the tale for twenty-five years, and I ain't got no occasion for to dispute it. They so many things a body knows as lies that they ain't no use going round finding fault with tales that might just as well be so as not. For instance, there's a young nigger going to school in town, and he come out here the other day and loud that the sun stood still, and the earth turned round every day on a kind of axe tree. I told that young nigger if he didn't take himself away with them lies, I'd take a buggy trace to him. If I sees the earth standing still all the time and I sees the sun going around it, and if a man can't believe what he sees, I can't see no use in living. Might's well die and be where we can't see nothing. And another thing what proves the tale about this old Primus is the way he goes on if anybody asks him how he come by that club foot. I asked him one day, mighty polite and civil, and he called me an old fool and got so mad he ain't spoke to me since. It's monstrous queer. But this is a queer world, any way you could fix it, concluded the old man with a weary sigh. If you makes up your mind not to buy that mule, sir, he added as he rose to go, I knows a man what's got a good hoss he wants to sell. Leastways, that's what I heard. I'm going to prayer meeting tonight, and I'm going right by the man's house, and if you'd like to take a look at the hoss, I'll ask him to fetch him round. Oh, yes. I said, you can ask him to stop in if he is passing. There will be no harm in looking at the horse, though I rather think I shall buy a mule. Early next morning, the man brought the horse up to the vineyard. At that time, I was not a very good judge of horse flesh. The horse appeared sound and gentle, and as the owner assured me, had no bad habits. The man wanted a large price for the horse, but finally agreed to accept a much smaller sum, upon payment of which I became possessed of a very fine-looking animal. But alas for the deceitfulness of appearances! I soon ascertained that the horse was blind in one eye, and that the sight of the other was very defective, and not a month elapsed before my purchase developed most of the diseases that horse-flesh is heir to and a more worthless, broken-winded, spavin quadruped never disgraced the noble name of horse. After worrying through two or three months of life, he expired one night in a fit of the colic. I replaced him with a mule, and Julius henceforth had to take his chances of driving some metamorphosed unfortunate. Circumstances that afterwards came to my knowledge created in my mind a strong suspicion that Julius may have played a more than unconscious part in this transaction. Among other significant facts was his appearance, the Sunday following the purchase of the horse, in a new suit of store clothes, which I had seen displayed in the window of Mr. Solomon Cohen's store on my last visit to town, and had remarked on account of their striking originality of cut and pattern. As I had not recently paid Julius any money, and as he had no property to mortgage, I was driven to conjecture to account for his possession of the means to buy the clothes. Of course, I would not charge him with duplicity unless I could prove it, at least to a moral certainty, but for a long time afterwards I took his advice only in small doses and with great discrimination. Sis Becky's Piccaninny we had not lived in North Carolina very long before I was able to note a marked improvement in my wife's health. The ozone-laden air of the surrounding piney woods, the mild and equable climate, the peaceful leisure of country life, 
had brought about in hopeful measure the cure we had anticipated. Toward the end of our second year, however, her ailment took an unexpected turn for the worse. She became the victim of a settled melancholy, attended with vague forebodings of impending misfortune. "'You must keep up her spirits,' said our physician, the best in the neighboring town. "'This melancholy lowers her tone too much, tends to lessen her strength, and, if it continue too long, may be fraught with grave consequences. I tried various expedients to cheer her up. I read novels to her. I had the hands on the place come up in the evening and serenade her with plantation songs. Friends came in sometimes and talked, and frequent letters from the north kept her in touch with her former home. But nothing seemed to rouse her from the depression into which she had fallen. One pleasant afternoon in spring, I placed an armchair in a shaded portion of the front piazza, and, filling it with pillows, led my wife out of the house and seated her where she would have the pleasantest view of a somewhat monotonous scenery. She was scarcely placed when old Julius came through the yard, and, taking off his tattered straw hat, inquired somewhat anxiously, "'How is you feeling this afternoon, ma'am?' "'She is not very cheerful, Julius,' I said. My wife was apparently without energy enough to speak for herself. The old man did not seem inclined to go away, so I asked him to sit down. I had noticed, as he came up, that he held some small object in his hand. When he had taken his seat on the top step, he kept fingering this object. What it was, I could not quite make out. "'What is that you have there, Julius?' I asked with mild curiosity. "'This is my rabbit foot, sir.' This was at a time before this curious superstition had attained its present jocular popularity among white people, and while I had heard of it before, it had not yet outgrown the charm of novelty. "'What do you do with it?' "'I cares it with me for luck, sir.' "'Julius,' I observed half to him and half to my wife, your people will never rise in the world until they throw off these childish superstitions and learn to live by the light of reason and common sense. How absurd to imagine that the forefoot of a poor dead rabbit, with which he timorously felt his way along through a life surrounded by snares and pitfalls, beset by enemies on every hand, can promote happiness or success or ward off failure or misfortune. "'It is ridiculous,' assented my wife, with faint interest. "'That's what I tells these niggers round here,' said Julius. "'The foot ain't got no power. It has to be the hind foot, sir. The left hind foot, a graveyard rabbit, killed by a cross-eyed nigger on a dark night in the full of the moon.' "'They must be very rare and valuable,' I said." They is kind of scarce, sir, and they ain't no amount of money could buy mine, sir. I might lend it to anybody I saw stop by, but I wouldn't sell it. No, indeed, sir, I wouldn't. How do you know it brings good luck? I asked. Cause I ain't had no bad luck since I had it, sir, and I's had this rabbit foot for forty years. I had a good master before the war, and I wasn't sold away, and I was sot free. And that is all good luck. But that doesn't prove anything, I rejoined. Many other people have gone through a similar experience, and probably more than one of them had no rabbit's foot. Law, sir, you don't have to prove but the rabbit foot. Everybody knows that. Leastways, everybody round here knows it. But if it has to be proved to folks what wasn't born and raised in this neighborhood, there is a easy way to prove it. Is I ever told you the tale of Sis Becky and a pickaninny? No, I said. Let us hear it. I thought perhaps the story might interest my wife as much or more than the novel I had meant to read from. This year Becky, Julius began, used to belong to old Colonel Pennington, who owned a plantation down on the Wimbledon Road, about ten miles from here, just before you gets to Black Swamp. This here Becky was a field hand, and a monstrous good'un. 
She had a husband once, a nigger what belonged to the next plantation. But the man what owned her husband died, and his land and his niggers had to be sold for to pay his debts. Colonel Pennington lied he'd have bought this nigger, but he had been betting on horse races and didn't have no money. And so Becky's husband was sold away to Virginia. Course Becky went on some about losing a man, but she couldn't help herself. And besides that, she had a pickaninny for the comforter. This here little Mose was the cutest, blackish, shiny-eyedest little nigger you ever laid eyes on, and he was as fond of his mammy as his mammy was of him. Course, Becky had to work and didn't have much time to waste with a baby. Old Aunt Nancy, the plantation nurse down at the quarters, used to take care of little Mose in the daytime, and after the niggers come in from the cotton field, Becky would get her child and kiss him and nurse him and keep him to moaning and on Sundays she'd have him in the cabin with her all day long. Sis Becky had got sort of used to getting along without her husband, when one day Colonel Pennington went to the races. Course, when he went to the races, he took his horses, and course he bet on his own horses, and course he lost his money, for Colonel Pennington didn't never have no luck with his horses, if he did keep himself po projecting with him. But this time there was a horse named Lightning Bug, what belonged to another man, and this horse won the sweepstakes. And Colonel Pennington took a lackin' to that horse and asked his owner what he was willing to take for him. I'll take a thousand dollars for that horse, says this year man, who had a big plantation down towards Wimbledon where he raised horses for the race and to sell. Well, Colonel Pennington scratched his head and wondered where he was going to raise a thousand dollars, and he didn't see just how he could do it for he owed as much as he could borrow already on the sciotity he could give. But he was just bound to have that horse, so says he, I'll give you my note for eleven hundred dollars for that horse. The other man shook his head and says he, Your note, sir, is better than gold, I don't doubt. But I has made it a rule in my business not to take no notes from nobody. Howsomever, sir, if you is kind of short of funds, most likely we can make some kind of bargain. And whilst we is talking, I might as well say that I needs another good nigger down in my place. If you has got a good one to spare, I might trade with you. Now, Colonel Pennington didn't really have no niggers for to spare, but he lied to himself he was just pleased to have that horse, and so he says, says he, Well, I don't lack to, but I reckon I have to. You come out to my plantation to ma and look over my niggers and pick out the one you wants. So sure enough, next day this here man come out to Colonel Pennison's place and rid round the plantation and glanced at the niggers, and who should he pick out from them all but Sis Becky? I needs a new nigger woman down to my place, says he, for to cook and wash and so on, and that young woman will just fill the bill. You give me her, and you can have lightning bug. Now, Colonel Pennington didn't like to trade Sister Becky, cause she was nigh about the best field hand he had. Besides, my Colonel didn't care to take the mammies away from their children whilst their children was little. But this man say he want Becky, or else Colonel Pennington couldn't have the race horse. Well, says the Colonel, you can have the woman, but I don't like to send her away from a baby. What do you give me for that nigger baby? I don't want the baby says the other man. I ain't got no use for that baby. I'll tell you what I'll do, lies Colonel Pennington. I'll throw that pickaninny in for good measure. But the other man shook his head. No, says he. I is much obliged, but I don't raise niggers. I raise horses, and I don't want to be bothered with no nigger babies. Never mind the baby. I'll keep that woman so busy she'll forget the baby. For niggers is made to work and they ain't got no time for no such foolishness as babies. Colonel Pennington didn't want to hurt Becky's feelings, for Colonel Pennington was a kind-hearted man, and never lacked to make no trouble for nobody, and so he told Becky he was going to send her down to Robeson County for a day or so to help out his son-in-law in his work, and being as this other man was going that way, he had asked him to take her along in his buggy. "'Can I carry a little moles with me, massa?' asked this Becky. Mm, no, 
says the colonel, as if he was studying whether to let her take him or no. I reckon you better let Aunt Nancy look after your baby for the day or two you'll be gone, and she'll see that he gets enough to eat till you gets back. So Sis Becky hugged and kissed little Mose, and told him to be a good little pickaninny, and take care of himself, and not forget his mammy while she was gone. And little Mose put his arms around his mammy, and laughed and crowed just like it was monstrous fine fun for his mammy to go away and leave him. Well, this here horse trader started out with Becky, and by and by, after they'd gone down the Lumberton Road for a few miles or so, this man turned round in a different direction, and kept going that way, till by and by Sister Becky up and asked him if he was going to Robeson County by a new road. Nah, nigger, says he, I ain't going to Robeson County at all. I's going to Bladen County, where my plantation is, and where I raises all my horses. But how is I going to get to Miss Laura's plantation down in Robeson County, says Becky, with a heart in her mouth, for she commenced to get skeered all of a sudden. You ain't going to get there at all, says the man. You belongs to me now, for I done traded my best race horse for you, with your old massa. If you's a good gal, I treat you right, and if you don't behave yourself, why, what else happens will be your own fault. Call sis Becky cried and went on about a pickaninny, but of course it didn't do no good, and by and by they got down to this here man's place, and he put sis Becky to work, and forgot all about her having a pickaninny. Meanwhile, when evening come, the day sis Becky was took away, little Mose commenced to get restless, and by and by, when his mammy didn't come, he started to cry for her. Aunt Nancy fed him and rocked him and rocked him, and finally he just cried and cried till he cried himself to sleep. The next day, he didn't appear to be as pert as usual, and when night come, he fretted and went on worse than he did the night before. The next day, his little eyes commenced to lose their shine, and he wouldn't eat nothing, and he commenced to look so peaked that Aunt Nancy took and carried him up to the big house and showed him to her old missus, and her old missus gun her some medicine for him, and loud if he didn't get no better, she should fetch him up to the big house again, and they'd have a doctor, and nurse little Mose up there, for Aunt Nancy's old missus loud he was a lackly little nigger and worth raising. But Aunt Nancy had learnt to like little Mose, and she didn't want to have him took up to the big house. And so when he didn't get no better, she gathered a mess of green peas and took the peas and the baby and went to see old Aunt Peggy, the conjure woman down by the Wimbledon Road. She gun Aunt Peggy the mess of peas and told her about Sis Becky and little Mose. That is a monstrous small mess of peas you was fotch me, says Aunt Peggy, says she. Yes, I knows, loud Aunt Nancy, but this year is a monstrous small pickaninny. You'll have to fetch me something more, says Aunt Peggy, for you can't expect me to waste my time digging roots and working conjugation for nothing. All right, says Aunt Nancy, I'll fetch you something more next time. You better, says Aunt Peggy, or else there'll be trouble. What this here little pickin' in he needs is to see his mammy. You leave him here this evening, and I'll show him his mammy. So, when Aunt Nancy had gone away, Aunt Peggy took and worked her roots, and turned little Mose to a hummingbird, and sawn him off for to find his mammy. So little Mose flewed and flewed and flewed away, till by and by he got to the place where Sis Becky belonged. He seed his mammy working round the yard, and he could tell from looking at her that she was troubled in the mind about something, and feeling kind of poorly. Sis Becky heard something humming round and round her, sweet and low. First she thought it was a hummingbird, then she thought it sounded like a little mose crooning on her breast, way back yonder on the old plantation. And she just imagined it was a little mose, and it made her feel better. And she went on by the work perder than she'd done since she'd been down there. Little Mose stayed round till late in the evening, and then flew back as hard as he could to Aunt Peggy. As for Sis Becky, she dreamt all that night that she was holding her pickaninny in her arms, and kissing him and nursing him, just like she used to do back on the old plantation where he was born. And for three or four days, Sis Becky went about her work with more spirit than she'd showed since she'd been down there to this man's plantation. 
De next day after he come back, Lil Mose was mo' purder and better than he had been for a long time. But towards the end of the week, he meant to get restless again and stop eating, and Aunt Nancy carried him down to Aunt Peggy once more, and she turned him to a mockingbird this time, and sought him off to see his mammy again. It didn't take him long for to get there, and when he did, he seed his mammy standing in the kitchen, looking back in the direction Lil Mose was coming from and they was tears in her eyes, and she looked more poly and peaked than she had when he was down there before. So little Mose sought on a tree in the yard, and sung and sung and sung, just fitting to split his throat. First, Sis Becky didn't notice him much, but this mockingbird kept staying round the house all day, and by and by Sis Becky just imagined that mockingbird was her little Mose, crowing and crowing, just like he used to do when his mammy would come home at night from the cotton field. The mockingbird stayed round there most all day, and when Sis Becky went out in the yard one time, this here mockingbird lit on her shoulder and peck at the piece of bread she was eating, and fluttered his wings so they rub up again the side of her head. And when he flew away long late in the evening, just for sundown, Sis Becky felt more better than she had since she had heard that hummingbird a week or so past. And that night she dreamt about old times again, just like she did before. But this here toting little Mose down to old Aunt Peggy, and this here getting things for the pay to conjure woman, use up a lot of Aunt Nancy's time, and she begun to get kind of tired. Besides that, when Sis Becky had been on the plantation, she had used to help Aunt Nancy with the youngins evenings and Sundays. And Aunt Nancy commenced to miss her monstrous, especially since she got a touch of the rheumatiz herself, and so she allows to old Aunt Peggy one day, Aunt Peggy, Ain't they no way you can fetch Sis Becky back home? Huh, says Aunt Peggy. I don't know about that. I'll have to work my roots and find out whether I can or no. But it'll take a monstrous heap of work, and I can't waste my time for nothing. If you'll fetch me something to pay me for my trouble, I reckon we can fix it. So next day, Aunt Nancy went down to see Aunt Peggy again. Aunt Peggy, says she, I has fought you my best Sunday head handkerchief. Will that do? Aunt Peggy look at the head handkerchief and run a hand over it, and says she, Yes, that'll do first rate. I's been working my roots since you been gone, and I allows most likely I can get Sis Becky back, but it's going to take figuring and studying as well as conjuring. The first thing to do will be to stop fetching that pickaninny down here and not send him to see his mammy no more. If it gets too poly, you let me know, and I'll give you some kind of mixture for to make em forget Sis Becky for a week or so. So lessen you comes for that, you needn't to come back to see me no more till I sends for you. So Aunt Peggy saw Aunt Nancy away, and the first thing she done was to call a hornet from her nest on her eaves. You go up to Colonel Pendleton's stable, hornet, says she, and sting the knees at a racehorse named Lightning Bug. Be sure and get the right one. So the hornet flew up to Colonel Pennington's stable and stung Lightning Bug round the legs. And the next morning, Lightning Bug's knees was all swole up, twice as big as they ought to be. When Colonel Pennington went out to the stable and see the horse's legs, it would have just made you tremble like a leaf for to hear him cuss that horse trader. Howsomever, he cooled off by and by and told the stable boy for to rub lightning bug's legs with some liniment. The boy done as his master told him, and by the next day the swelling had gone down considerable. Aunt Peggy had sawn a sparrow what had a nest in one of the trees close to her cabin for to watch what was going on round the big house, and when this here sparrow told her the hoss was getting over the swelling, she sent the hornet back for to sting his knees some more, and the next morning lightning bug's legs was swole up worse than before. Well, this time, Colonel Pendleton was mad through and through, and all the way round, and he cussed that horse trader up and down, from A to Izzard. He cussed so hard that the stable boy got most scared to death, and went off and hid himself in the hay. As for Colonel Pendleton, he went right up to the house, and got out his pen and ink, and took off his coat, and rolled up his sleeves, and read a letter to this here horse trader, and says he, you has sold me a hoss what has got a ring-bone or a spavin or something, 
and what I paid you for was a sound horse. I want you to send my nigger woman back and take your old hoss, or else I'll sue you, shows you bone. But this here man wasn't scared a bit, and he writ back to Colonel Pennington that a bargain was a bargain, that Lightning Bug was sound when he sold him, and if Colonel Pennington didn't know enough about horses to take care of a fine racer, that was his own funeral. And they say Colonel Pennington can sue and be cussed for all he care, but he ain't going to give up the nigger he bought and paid for. When Colonel Pennington got this letter, he was mad than he was before, especially because the man loud he didn't know how to take care of fine horses. But he couldn't do nothing but fetch a lawsuit, and he knowed by his own expense that lawsuits was slow as a seven-year itch and cost more than they come to, and he allowed he better go slow and wait a while. Aunt Peggy knowed what was going on all this time, and she fix up a little bag with some roots and one thing or another in it, and gun it to this sparrow, hern, and told him to take it way down yonder where Sis Becky was, and drap it right before the door of her cabin, so she'd be sure and find it the first time she come out in the door. One night, Sis Becky dreamt her pickaninny was dead, and the next day she was moaning and groaning all day. She dreamt the same dream three nights running, and then, the next morning after the last night, she found this yer little bag the sparrow had dropped in front of her door, and she allowed she'd been conjured, and was going to die, and as long as her pickaninny was dead, they wasn't no use trying to do nothing, no how. And so she took and went to bed, and told her master she'd been conjured, and was going to die. Her master laughed at her, and argued with her, and tried to sway her out of this here fool notion, as he called it, for he was one of these here white folks would pretend they don't believe in conjuring, but it wasn't no use. Sis Becky kept getting worser and worser, till finally this here man loud Sis Becky was going to die sure enough, and as he knowed they hadn't been nothing the matter with Lightning Bug when he traded him, he loud maybe he could cure him and fetch him round all right, leastways good enough to sell again. And anyhow, a lame hoss was better than a dead nigger. So he sat down and writ Colonel Pennington a letter. My conscience, says he, has been troubling me about that ring-bone hoss I sold you. Some folks slows a hoss trader ain't got no conscience, but they don't know me, for that is my weak spot, and the reason I ain't made no more money hoss trading. Fact is, says he, I has got so I can't sleep nights from studying about that spavin hoss, and I has made up my mind that whilst a bargain is a bargain, and you seed lightning bug before you traded for him, principal is worth more than money, or horses, or niggers. So if you'll send lightning bug down here, I'll send your nigger woman back, and we'll call the trade off, and be as good friends as we ever was, and no hard feelings. So, sure enough, Colonel Pendleton sought the horse back, and when the man would come to bring lightning bug told Sis Becky her picking any wasn't dead, Sis Becky was so glad that she allowed she was going to try to live till she got back where she could see little Mose once more. And when she reached the old plantation and seed her baby kicking and crowing and holding out his little arms towards her, she wished she wasn't conjured and didn't have to die. And when Aunt Nancy told her all about Aunt Peggy, Sis Becky went down to see the conjure woman, and Aunt Peggy told her she had conjured her. And then Aunt Peggy took the goofer off in her, and she got well, and stayed on the plantation and raised her pickaninny. And when little Mose growed up, he could sing and whistle just like a mockingbird, so that the white folks used to have him come up to the big house at night and whistle and sing for him, and they used to give him money and vittles and one thing or another, which he always took home to his mammy, for he knowed all about what she had gone through. He turned out to be a smart man and learnt the blacksmith trade, and Colonel Pennington let him high his time. And by and by he bought his mammy and sought her free, and then he bought himself and took care of Sis Becky as long as they both lived. My wife had listened to this story with greater interest than she had manifested in any subject for several days. I had watched her furtively from time to time during the recital, and had observed the play of her countenance. It had expressed in turn sympathy, indignation, pity, and, at the end, lively satisfaction. That is a very ingenious fairy tale, Julius, I said, 
and we are much obliged to you. Why, John, said my wife severely, the story bears the stamp of truth, if ever a story did. Yes, I replied, especially the hummingbird episode and the mockingbird digression, to say nothing of the doings of the hornet and the sparrow. Oh, well, I don't care, she rejoined with delightful animation. Those are mere ornamental details, and not at all essential. The story is true to nature, and might have happened half a hundred times, and no doubt did happen in those horrid days before the war. By the way, Julius, I remarked, your story doesn't establish what you started out to prove, that a rabbit's foot brings good luck. It's plain enough to me, sir, replied Julius. I bet young Mrs. Dare can explain it herself. I rather suspect, replied my wife promptly, that Sis Becky had no rabbit's foot. You was hit the bull's eye to fuss fire, ma'am, assented Julius. If Sis Becky had had a rabbit foot, she never would have went through all this trouble. I went into the house for some purpose, and left Julius talking to my wife. When I came back a moment later, he was gone. My wife's condition took a turn for the better from this very day, and she was soon on the way to ultimate recovery. Several weeks later, after she had resumed her afternoon drives, which had been interrupted by her illness, Julius brought the rockaway round to the front door one day, and I assisted my wife into the carriage. John, she said before I had taken my seat, I wish you would look in my room and bring me my handkerchief. You will find it in the pocket of my blue dress. I went to execute the commission. When I pulled the handkerchief out of her pocket, something else came with it and fell on the floor. I picked up the object and looked at it. It was Julius's rabbit's foot. Section 6 of The Conjure Woman by Charles Waddell Chestnut THE GREY WOLF'S HAUNT It was a rainy day at the vineyard. The morning had dawned bright and clear. But the sky had soon clouded, and by nine o'clock there was a light shower, followed by others at brief intervals. By noon the rain had settled into a dull, steady downpour. The clouds hung low, and seemed to grow denser instead of lighter as they discharged their watery burden and there was now and then a muttering of distant thunder. Outdoor work was suspended, and I spent most of the day at the house, looking over my accounts and bringing up some arrears of correspondence. Towards four o'clock I went out on the piazza, which was broad and dry, and less gloomy than the interior of the house, and composed myself for a quiet smoke. I had lit my cigar, and opened the volume I was reading at that time, when my wife, whom I had left dozing on a lounge, came out and took a rocking-chair near me. "'I wish you would talk to me, or read to me, or something,' she exclaimed petulantly. "'It's awfully dull here today.' "'I'll read to you with pleasure,' I replied, and began at the point where I had found my bookmark." The difficulty of dealing with transformations so many-sided as those which all existences have undergone, or are undergoing, is such as to make a complete and deductive interpretation almost hopeless. So to grasp the total process of redistribution of matter and motion, as to see simultaneously its several necessary results in their actual interdependence, is scarcely possible. There is, however, a mode of rendering the process as a whole tolerably comprehensible. Though the genesis of the rearrangement of every evolving aggregate is in itself one, it presents to our intelligence— John, interrupted my wife, I wish you would stop reading that nonsense and see who that is coming up the lane. I closed my book with a sigh. I had never been able to interest my wife in the study of philosophy, even when presented in the simplest and most lucid form. Someone was coming up the lane, at least a huge faded cotton umbrella was making progress toward the house, and beneath it a pair of nether extremities in trousers was discernible. 
Any doubt in my mind as to whose they were was soon resolved when Julius reached the steps, and, putting the umbrella down, got a good dash of the rain as he stepped up on the porch. "'Why in the world, Julius?' I asked. "'Didn't you keep the umbrella up until you got under cover?' "'It's bad luck, sir, to raise an umbrella in the house, and whiles I don't know whether it's bad luck to carry one into the piazza or no, I allows it's allus best to be on the safe side. I didn't s'pose you and young missus would be goin' on your drive today, but bein' as it's my pot to take you if you does, I lied I'd report for duty and let you say whether or no you wants to go. I'm glad you came, Julius, I responded. We don't want to go driving, of course, in the rain, but I should like to consult you about another matter. I'm thinking of taking in a piece of new ground. What do you imagine it would cost to have that neck of woods down by the swamp cleared up? The old man's countenance assumed an expression of unwonted seriousness, and he shook his head doubtfully. I don't know about that, sir. It might cost more, and it might cost less, as far as money is concerned. I ain't denying you could clear up that track of land for a hundred or a couple of hundred dollars, if you wants to clear it up. But if that is my track of land, I wouldn't disturb it. No, sir, I wouldn't. Shows you born, I wouldn't. But why not, I asked. It ain't fitting for grapes, for new ground never is. I know it, but it ain't no yethly good for cotton, cause it's too low. Perhaps, but it will raise splendid corn. I don't know rejoined Julius deprecatorially. It's so near the swamp that the coons will eat up all the corn. I think I'll risk it, I answered. Well, sir, said Julius, I wishes you much joy of your job. If you has bad luck or sickness or trouble or any kind, don't blame me. You can't say old Julius didn't warn you. Warn him of what, Uncle Julius? asked my wife. Or the bad luck what follows folks what stubs that track of land. There is snakes and scorpions in them woods, and if you manages to escape the poison animals, you is just bound to have a haunt to settle with, if you don't have two. Whose haunt? my wife demanded with growing interest. The gray wolf's haunt, some folks calls it, but I knows better. Tell us about it, Uncle Julius, said my wife. A story will be a godsend today. It was not difficult to induce the old man to tell a story, if he were in a reminiscent mood. Of tales of the old slavery days he seemed indeed to possess an exhaustless store, some weirdly grotesque, some broadly humorous, some bearing the stamp of truth, faint perhaps, but still discernible. Others palpable inventions, whether his own or not we never knew though his fancy doubtless embellished them. But even the wildest was not without an element of pathos, the tragedy, it might be, of the story itself, the shadow, never absent, of slavery and of ignorance, the sadness always of life as seen by the fading light of an old man's memory. Way back yonder, before the war, began Julius, Old Massa Dougal McAdoo used to own a nigger named Dan. Dan was big and strong and hearty and peaceable and good-natured, most of the time, but dangerous to aggravate. He allus done his task and never had no trouble with the white folks, but woe be unto a nigger what loud he could fool with Dan, for he was most sure to get a good lambing. Soon as everybody found Dan out, they didn't many of em tempt to disturb em. The one that did would a wish he hadn't, if he could a lived long enough to do any wishing. It all happened this way. There was a conjure man would lived over to the other side of the Lumberton Road. He had been the only conjure doctor in the neighborhood for long this many years, till old Aunt Peggy sought up in the business down by the Wimbledon Road. This conjure man had a son would live with him and it was this year's son what got mixed up with Dan, and all by the woman. There was a gal on the plantation named Mahaley, 
she was a monstrous lackly gal, tall and supple, with big eyes and a small foot, and a lively tongue, and when Dan took to going with her, everybody allowed they was well matched, and none of the other nigger men on the plantation dares to go near, for they was all feared of Dan. Now, it happened that this year conjure man's son was going along the road one day, when who should come past but Mahaley. And the minute this man sought eye on Mahaley, he allowed he was going to have her for herself. He come up side of her, and minced to talk to her, but she didn't pay no attention to him, for she was studying about Dan, and she didn't like this nigger's looks no how. So when she got to where she was going, this year man wasn't no further along than he was when he started. Course, after he had made up his mind for to get Mahaley, he commenced to quire around, and soon found out all about Dan, and what a dangerous nigger he was. But this man allowed his daddy was a conjure man, and so he come out all right in the end, and he kept right after Mahaley. Meanwhile, Dan's master had said they could get mad if they want her, and so Dan and Mahaley had took up with one another, and was living in a cabin by themselves and was just wrop up in one another. But this here conjure man's son didn't appear to mind Dan's taking up with Mahaley, and he kept on hanging round just the same, till finally one day Mahaley says to Dan, says she, I wish you'd do something to stop that free nigger man from following me round. I don't like him no how, and I ain't got no time for to waste with no man but you. Course Dan got mad when he heard about this man pestering Mahaley, and the next night, when he see this nigger coming along the road, he up and asked him what he mean by hanging round his woman. The man didn't respond to suit Dan, and one word led to another, till by and by this conjure man's son pull out a knife and started to stick it in Dan. But before he could get it drawed good, Dan haul off and hit him in the head so hard that he never got up. Dan loud he come to after a while and go along by the business, so it went off and left him laying there on the ground. The next morning the man was found dead. There was a great miration made about it, but Dan didn't say nothing, and none of the other niggers hadn't seen the fight, so there wasn't no way to tell who done the killing. And being as it was a free nigger, and there wasn't no white folks specially interested, there wasn't nothing done about it, and the conjure man come and took his son and carried him away and buried him. Now Dan hadn't meant to kill this nigger, and whilst he knowed the man hadn't got no more than he deserved, Dan commenced to worry more or less, for he knowed this man's daddy would work his roots and probably find out who'd killed his son and make all the trouble for him he could. And Dan kept on studying by this till he got so he didn't hardly dast to eat or drink for fear this conjure man had poisoned the bitters of the water. Finally, he allowed he'd go to see Aunt Peggy, the new conjure woman would had moved down by the Wilmington Road, and ask her for to do something to protect him from this conjure man. So he took a peck of taters and went down to a cabin one night. Aunt Peggy heard his tale, and then says she, That conjure man is more than twice as old as I is, and he can make monstrous powerful goofer. What you needs is a life charm, and I'll make you one tomorrow. It's the only thing what'll do you any good. You leave me a couple of hairs from your head, and fetch me a pig tomorrow night for the roast, and when you come, I'll have the charm all ready for you. So Dan went down to Aunt Peggy the next night, with a young shoat, and Aunt Peggy got him the charm. She had took the hairs Dan had left with her in a piece of red flannel, and some roots and yerbs, and had put them in a little bag made out of coon skin. You take this charm, says she, and put it in a bottle of a tin box, and bear it deep under the root of a live oak tree and as long as it stays there safe and sound, there ain't no poison can poison you, there ain't no rattlesnake can bite you, there ain't no scorpion can sting you. This here conjure man might do one thing or another to you, but he can't kill you. So you need to be at all scared, but go long about your business and don't bother your mind. So Dan went down by the river, and way up on the bank he buried the charm deep under the root of a live oak tree, and covered it up and stomped the dirt down and scattered leaves over the spot, and then went home with his mind easy. Sure enough, this year conjure man worked his roots, just as Dan had expected he would, 
and soon learned who killed his son. And cause he made up his mind for to get even with Dan, so he sought a rattlesnake for to sting him. But the rattlesnake say the nigger's heels was so hard he couldn't get a sting in. Then he sent a jaybird for to put poison in Dan's vittles, but the poison didn't work. Then the conjure man allowed he'd double Dan all up with the rheumatiz, so he couldn't get his hand to his mouth to eat, and would have to starve to death. But Dan went to Aunt Peggy, and she got him her ointment to cure the rheumatiz. Then the conjure man allowed he'd burn Dan up with a fever, but Aunt Peggy told him how to make some yerb tea for that. Nothing this man tried would kill Dan, so finally the conjure man allowed Dan must have a life charm. Now this here jaybird the conjure man had was a monstrous smart critter. Fact, the niggers allowed he was the old devil himself, just sitting round waiting to carry this old man away when he reached the end of his rope. The conjure man sought this jaybird for to watch Dan and find out where he kept his charm. The jaybird hung round Dan for a week or so, and one day he see Dan go down by the river and look at a live oak tree. And then the jaybird went back to his master and told him he spec the nigger kept his life charm under that tree. The conjure man laughed and laughed, and he put on his biggest pot and fit it with his strongest roots, and boiled it and boiled it, till by and by the wind blowed and blowed till it blowed down the live oak tree. Then he stirred some more roots in the pot, and it rained and rained till the water run down the river bank and washed Dan's life charm into the river, and the bottle went bobbing down the current just as unconcerned as if it wasn't taking Poe Dan's chances all along with it. And then the conjure man laughed some more, and lied to himself that he was going to fix Dan now, sure enough. He wasn't going to kill him just yet, but he could do something to him what would hurt worse than kill him. So this conjure man commenced to going up to Dan's cabin every night, and taking Dan out in his sleep, and riding him round the roads and fields over the rough ground. In the morning, Dan would be as tired as if he hadn't been to sleep. This kind of thing kept up for a week or so, and Dan had just about made up his mind for to go and see Aunt Peggy again, when who should it come across, going along the road one day, toward sundown, but is he a conjure man? Dan felt kind of scared at first, but then he remembered about his life charm, which he hadn't been to see for a week or so, and loud was safe and sound under the live oak tree. And so he held up his head and walked long just like he didn't care nothing about this man no more than any other nigger. When he got close to the conjure man, this conjure man says, says he, Hi there, brother Dan. I hope you're well. When Dan seed the conjure man was in a good humor and didn't appear to bear no malice, Dan allowed maybe the conjure man hadn't found out who killed his son, and so he determined for to let on like he didn't know nothing, and so says he, How there, Uncle Jube? This old conjure man's name was Jube. I's pretty well, thank you. How's you feeling this morning? I's feeling as well as old nigger could feel what had lost his only son and his main dependence in his old age. But then my son was a bad boy, says he and I couldn't speck nothing else. I tried to learn him to air his ways and make him go to church and prayer meeting, but it wasn't no use. I don't know who killed him, and I don't want to know, for I'd be most sure to find out that my boy had started the fuss. If I'd had a son like you, brother Dan, I'd have been a proud nigger. Oh, yes, I would, shows you born. But you ain't looking as well as you are, brother Dan. There's something the matter with you. And what's more, I spec you don't know what it is. Now this here kind of talk naturally throwed Dan off in his guard, and first thing he knowed he was talking to this old conjure man just like he was one of his best friends. He told him all about not feeling well in the morning, and asked him if he could tell what was the matter with him. Yes, says the conjure man, there's a witch been riding you right along. I can see the marks of the bridle on your mouth and I'll just bet your back is raw where she been beating you. Yes, respond Dan, so it is. He hadn't noticed it before, but now it felt just like the hide had been took off of him. 
and your thighs is just raw where the spurs has been driving in you says the conjure man you can't see the raw spots but you can feel em oh yes lows dan they does hurt powerful bad and what's more says the conjure man coming up close to dan and whispering in his ear i knows who it is been riding you who is it asks dan tell me who it is it's a old nigger woman down by rockfish creek she had a pet rabbit and you caught him one day and she's been squaring up with you ever since but you better stop her or else she'll be rid to death in a month or so no says dan she can't kill me show i don't know how that is said the conjure man but she can make your life mighty miserable if i was in your place i'd stop her right off but how is i going to stop her asked dan i don't know nothing about stopping witches look here dan says the other you was a good young man i likes you monstrous well fact i feels like some of these days i might buy you from your massa if i could ever make money enough at my business these hard times and dopt you for my son i likes you so well that i'm going to help you get rid of this here witch for good and all for just as long as she lives, you is sure to have trouble and trouble and mo' trouble. You is the best friend I got, Uncle Jube, says Dan, and I'll remember your kindness to my dying day. Tell me how I can get rid of this here old witch what's been riding me so hard. In the first place, says the conjure man, this old witch never comes in her own shape, but every night at ten o'clock she turns herself into a black cat and runs down to your cabin and bridles you and mounts you and drives you out through the chimbley and rides you over the roughest places she can find all you got to do is to set for her in the bushes side your cabin and hit her in the head with a rock or a lighted knot when she goes past but says dan how can i see her in the dark and supposing i hits her and misses her or supposing i just wounds her and she gets away what she gonna do to me then i's done studied about all them things says the conjure man and it pears to me the best plan for you to follow is to let me turn you to some creature what can see in the dark and what can run just as fast as a cat and what can bite and bite for the kill and then you won't have to have no trouble after the job is done i don't know whether you like that or not but that is the showest way i don't care spawn dan i'd just as lie be anything for an hour or so if i can kill that old witch you can do just what you a mind to all right then says the conjure man you come down to my cabin at half past nine o'clock tonight and i'll fix you up now this conjure man when he had got through talking with dan kept on down the road along the side of the plantation till he met mahaley coming home from work just at the sundown how to do ma'am says he is your name sister mahaley what belongs to mars dougal mcadoo yes respond mahaley that's my name and i belongs to mars dougal well says he your husband dan was down by my cabin this evening and he got bit by a spider or something and his foot is swole up so he can't walk and he asked me for to find you and fetch you down there to help him home Cost Mahaley want to see what had happened to Dan, and so she started down the road with the conjure man. As soon as he got her into his cabin, he shut the door and sprinkled some goof of mixtry on her, and turned her to a black cat. Then he took and put her in a barrel, and put a board on the barrel, and a rock on the board, and left her there till he got good and ready for the user. Long about half past nine o'clock. Dan come down to the conjure man's cabin. It was a warm night, and the door was standing open. The conjure man advised Dan to come in and pass the time of day with him. As soon as Dan commenced talking, he heard a cat meowing and scratching and going on at a terrible rate. What's all that fuss about? asked Dan. Oh, that ain't nothing but my old gray tomcat, says the conjure man. I has to shut him up sometimes for to keep him in nights and course he don't like it now lows the conjure man let me tell you just what you has got to do 
when you catches this witch, you must take her right by the throat and bite her right through the neck. Be sure your teeth goes through at the first bite, and then you won't never be bothered no more by that witch. And when you get done, come back here and I'll turn you to yourself again, so you can go home and get your night's rest. Then the conjure man gun Dan something nice and sweet to drink out in a new gourd, and in about a minute Dan found himself turned to a gray wolf and soon as he felt all four his new feet on the ground, he started off fast as he could for his own cabin, so he could be sure and be there time enough to catch the witch and put her in to her carrying's own. As soon as Dan was gone good, the conjure man took the rock off in the board and the board off in the barrel, and out leapt Mahaley and started for to go home, just like a cat or a woman or anybody else would what was in trouble and it wasn't many minutes before she was gone up the path to her own door. Meanwhile, when Dan had reached the cabin, he had hid himself in a bunch of jimson weeds in the yard. He hadn't waited long before he see the black cat run up the path towards the door. Just as soon as she got close to him, he leapt out and catch her by the throat, and got a grip on her, just like the conjure man had told him to do. And lo and behold, no sooner had the blood commenced to flow, then the black cat turned back to Mahaley, and Dan see that he had killed his own wife. And whilst her breath was gone, she called out, Oh, Dan, oh, my husband, come and help me. Come and save me from this wolf was killing me. When poor Dan started towards her, as any man naturally would, it just made her holler worse and worse, for she didn't know this here wolf was her Dan and Dan just had to hide in the weeds and grit his teeth and hold himself in till she passed out in her misery, calling for Dan to the last, and wondering why he didn't come and help her. And Dan lied to himself he'd rather have been killed a dozen times than to have done what he had to Mahaley. Dan was mighty nigh distracted, but when Mahaley was dead and he got his mind straightened out a little, it didn't take him more than a minute or so for to see through all the conjure man's lies and how the conjure man had fooled him and made him kill Mahaley for to get even with him for killing her his son. He kept getting madder and madder, and Mahaley hadn't much more than draw the last breath before he started back to the conjure man's cabin hard as he could run. When he got there, the door was standing open. A lighted knot was flicking on the hearth, and old conjure man was sitting there nodding in the corner. Dan leapt in the door and jumped for this man's throat and got the same grip on him what the conjure man had told him about half hour before. It was hard work this time, for the old man's neck was monstrous tough and stringy. But Dan held on long enough to be sure his job was done right. And even then he didn't hold on long enough, for when he turned the conjure man loose and he fell over on the floor, Conjure man wrote his eyes at Dan and says he, I's even with you, brother Dan, and you are even with me. You killed my son, and I killed your woman. And as I don't want no more than what's fair about this thing, if you'll wretch up with your pa and take down that gourd hanging on that peg over the chimney and take a sip of that mixture, it'll turn you back to a nigger again, and I can die most satisfied than if I left you like you is. Dan never lied for a minute that a man would lie with his last breath, and cause he see the sense of getting turned back before the conjure man died, so he clumb on a chair and retched for the gourd and took a sip of the mixture. And as soon as he'd done that, the conjure man laughed his last laugh and gasped out with his last gaps. Uh-huh. I reckon I square with you now for killing me too, for that goof on you is done fix and sot now for good and all the conjure in the world won't never take it off. Woof you is, and woof you stays, all the rest of your born days. Course, Brother Dan couldn't do nothing. He knowed it wasn't no use, but it clumbed up on the chimney and got down the gourds and bottles and other conjure fixings and tried em all on itself, but it didn't do no good. Then he run down to old Aunt Peggy, but she didn't know the wolf language and couldn't have took off this other goofer no how, even if she'd have understood what Dan was saying. So poor Dan was bleached to be a wolf all the rest of his bone days. They found Mahaley down by her own cabin next morning, 
and everybody made a great moderation about how she'd been killed. The niggers lot of woof it bitter. The white folks say no, there ain't been no wolves round there for ten years or more, and they didn't know what to make out in it. And when they couldn't find Dan nowhere, they lied he'd quarreled with Mahaley and killed her and run away, and they didn't know what to make of that, for Dan and Mahaley was the most loving couple on the plantation. They put the dogs on Dan's scent and tracked him down to old Uncle Jube's cabin and found the old man dead, and they didn't know what to make of that. And then Dan's scent gun out, and they didn't know what to make of that. Mas Dougal took on a heap bout losing two of his best hands in one day, and old Mrs. Loud it was a judgment on him for something he'd done. But that fall the crops was monstrous big, so Mas Dougal say the Lord had tempered the wind to the shown ram, and make up to him for what he had lost. They buried Mahaley down in that piece of low ground you were talking about clearing up. As for Poe Dan, he didn't have nowhere else to go, so he just stayed round Mahaley's grave when he wasn't out in the other woods getting something to eat. And sometimes when night would come, the niggers used to hear him howling and howling down there, just fitting to break his heat. And then some more of them said they seed Mahaley's haunt there bunnies of times, colloguing with this gray wolf. And even now, fifty years since, long after old Dan has died and dried up in the woods, his haunt and Mahaley's hangs round that piece of low ground, and everybody what goes about there has some bad luck or another, for haunts don't like to be disturbed on their own stomping ground. The air had darkened while the old man related this harrowing tale. The rising wind whistled around the eaves, slammed the loose window shutters, and, still increasing, drove the rain and fiercer gusts into the piazza. As Julius finished his story, and we rose to seek shelter within doors, the blast caught the angle of some chimney or gable in the rear of the house, and bore to our ears a long wailing note, an epitome, as it were, of remorse and hopelessness. "'That's just like poor old Dan used to howl,' observed Julius as he reached for his umbrella. "'And what I've been telling you is the reason I don't like to see that neck of woods cleared up. "'Cause it belongs to you, and a man can do as he choose with his own. "'But if he gets rheumatiz, or fever and auger, "'or if you're a snake bit, or poison with some yerb or another, "'or if a tree falls on you, or a haunt runs you and makes you get distracted in your mind, like some folks I knows what went fooling round that piece of land. You can't say I never warned you, sir, and told you what you might look for and be sure to find. When I cleared up the land in question, which was not until the following year, I recalled the story Julius had told us, and looked in vain for a sunken grave or perhaps a few weather-bleached bones of some denizen of the forest. I cannot say, of course, that someone had not been buried there, but, if so, the hand of time had long since removed any evidence of the fact. If some lone wolf, the last of his pack, had once made his den there, his bones had long since crumbled into dust and gone to fertilize the rank vegetation that formed the undergrowth of this wild spot. I did find, however, a bee-tree in the woods, with an ample cavity in its trunk, and an opening through which convenient access could be had to the stores of honey within. I have reason to believe that ever since I had bought the place, and for many years before, Julius had been getting honey from this tree. The gray wolf's haunt had doubtless proved useful in keeping off two inquisitive people who might have interfered with his monopoly. Section 7 of The Conjure Woman by Charles Waddell Chestnut Hotfoot Hannibal I hate you and despise you. I wish never to see you or speak to you again. Very well. I will take care that henceforth you have no opportunity to do either. These words, the first in the passionately vibrant tones of my sister-in-law, and the latter in the deeper and more restrained accents of an angry man, startled me from my nap. I had been dozing in my hammock on the front piazza, behind the honeysuckle vine. I had been faintly aware of a buzz of conversation in the parlor, 
but had not at all awakened to its import until these sentences fell, or, I might rather say, were hurled upon my ear. I presume the young people had either not seen me lying there, the Venetian blinds opening from the parlor windows upon the piazza were partly closed on account of the heat, or else, in their excitement, they had forgotten my proximity. I felt somewhat concerned. The young man, I had remarked, was proud, firm, jealous of the point of honor, and, from my observation of him, quite likely to resent to the bitter end what he deemed a slight or an injustice. The girl, I knew, was quite as high-spirited as young Murchison. I feared she was not so just, and hoped she would prove more yielding. I knew that her affections were strong and enduring, but that her temperament was capricious and her sunniest moods easily overcast by some small cloud of jealousy or pique. I had never imagined, however, that she was capable of such intensity as was revealed by these few words of hers. As I say, I felt concerned. I had learned to like Malcolm Murchison, and had heartily consented to his marriage with my ward, for it was in that capacity that I had stood for a year or two to my wife's younger sister, Mabel. The match, thus rudely broken off, had promised to be another link binding me to the kindly southern people among whom I had not long before taken up my residence. Young Murchison came out of the door, cleared the piazza in two strides without seeming aware of my presence, and went off down the lane at a furious pace. A few moments later, Mabel began playing the piano loudly, with a touch that indicated anger and pride and independence and a dash of exultation, as though she were really glad that she had driven away forever the young man whom the day before she had loved with all the ardor of a first passion. I hoped that time might heal the breach and bring the two young people together again. I told my wife what I had overheard. In return, she gave me Mabel's version of the affair. I do not see how it can ever be settled, my wife said. It is something more than a mere lover's quarrel. It began, it is true, because she found fault with him for going to church with that hateful Branson girl. But before it ended, there were things said that no woman of any spirit could stand. I am afraid it is all over between them. I was sorry to hear this. In spite of the very firm attitude taken by my wife and her sister, I still hoped that the quarrel would be made up within a day or two. Nevertheless, when a week had passed with no word from young Murchison, and with no sign of relenting on Mabel's part, I began to think myself mistaken. One pleasant afternoon, about ten days after the rupture, old Julius drove the rockaway up to the piazza, and my wife Mabel and I took our seats for a drive to a neighbor's vineyard, over on the Lumberton Plank Road. "'Which way shall we go?' I asked. "'The short road or the long one?' "'I guess we had better take the short road,' answered my wife. "'We will get there sooner.' "'It's a mighty fine drive round by the big road, Miss Annie,' observed Julius, "'and it don't take much longer to get there.' "'No,' said my wife. I think we will go by the short road. There is a bay tree in blossom near the mineral spring, and I wish to get some of the flowers. I specs you'd find some bay trees long the big road, ma'am, suggested Julius. But I know about the flowers on the short road, and they are the ones I want. We drove down the lane to the highway, and soon struck into the short road leading past the mineral spring. Our route lay partly through a swamp and on each side the dark, umbrageous foliage, unbroken by any clearing, lent to the road solemnity, and to the air a refreshing coolness. About half a mile from the house, and about halfway to the mineral spring, we stopped at the tree of which my wife had spoken, and reaching up to the low-hanging boughs, I gathered a dozen of the fragrant white flowers. When I resumed my seat in the rockaway, Julius started the mare. She went on for a few rods, until we had reached the edge of a branch crossing the road, when she stopped short. "'Why did you stop, Julius?' I asked. 
"'I didn't, sir,' he replied. "'Twas the mare's stop. "'Get along there, Lucy. "'What you mean by this foolishness?' "'Julius jerked the reins and applied the whip lightly, "'but the mare did not stir. "'Perhaps you had better get down and lead her,' I suggested. "'If you get her started, you can cross on the log and keep your feet dry.' "'Julius alighted, took hold of the bridle, "'and vainly essayed to make the mare move. "'She planted her feet with even more evident obstinacy. "'I don't know what to make of this,' I said. "'I have never known her to balk before.' "'Have you, Julius?' "'No, sir,' replied the old man. "'I never has. "'It's a curious thing to me, sir.' "'What's the best way to make her go?' "'I spec, sir, that if I'd turn her round, "'she'd go the other way. "'But we want her to go this way.' "'Well, sir, I lie if we just sit here for five minutes, "'she'll start up by herself.' "'All right,' I rejoined. It is cooler here than any place I have struck today. We'll let her stand for a while and see what she does. We had sat in silence for a few minutes when Julius suddenly ejaculated, Uh huh, I knows why this mare don't go. It just flashed across my recommendance. Why is it, Julius? I inquired. Cause she sees Chloe. Where is Chloe? I demanded. "'Chloe done been dead these forty years or mo,' the old man returned. "'Her haunt is settin' over yonder on the other side of the branch, under that willow tree, this blessed minute.' "'Why, Julius,' said my wife, "'do you see the haunt?' "'No,' nah, he answered, shaking his head. "'I don't see her, but the mare sees her.' "'How do you know?' I inquired. "'Well, sir,' This here is a gray hoss, and this here is a Friday, and a gray hoss can allus see a haunt what walks on Friday. Who was Chloe? said Mabel. And why does Chloe's haunt walk? asked my wife. It's all in the tale, ma'am, Julius replied, with a deep sigh. It's all in the tale. Tell us the tale, I said. Perhaps by the time you get through, the haunt will go away, and the mare will cross. I was willing to humor the old man's fancy. He had not told us a story for some time, and the dark and solemn swamp around us, the amber-colored stream flowing silently and sluggishly at our feet, like the waters of Lethe, the heavy aromatic scent of the bays faintly suggestive of funeral wreaths, all made the place an ideal one for a ghost story. Chloe, Julius began in a subdued tone, used to belong to old Mas Dougal McAdoo, my old master. She was a likely gal and a smart gal, and old Miss took up to the big house and learned her to wait on the white folks, till by and by she come to be Mrs. Old Maid, and peered to allow she run the house herself to hear her talk about it. I was a young boy then, and used to work about the stables, so I knowed everything that was going on round the plantation. Well, one time, Mas Dougal wanted a houseboy and sought down to the quarters for to have Jeff and Hannibal come up to the big house next morning. Old Massa and old Miss looked the two boys over and scussed with themselves for a little while, and then Mas Dougal says, says he, We lacks Hannibal the best, and we gonna keep him. Hey, Hannibal, you'll work at the house from now on, and if you a good nigger and minds your business, I'll give you Chloe for a wife next spring. You other nigger, you, Jeff, you can go back to the quarters. We ain't going to need you. Now, Chloe had been standing there behind old Miss doing all this here talk, and Chloe made up her mind from the very first minute she sought eyes on them two that she didn't like that nigger Hannibal and wasn't never going to care for him, and she was just as sure that she liked Jeff and was going to set stole by him, whether Mars Dougal took him in the big house or no. And so, cause Chloe was monstrous sorry when old Mars Dougal took Hannibal and sent Jeff back, so she slipped round the house and waylaid Jeff on the way back to the quarters, and told him not to be downhearted, for she was going to see if she couldn't find some way or another to get rid of that nigger Hannibal, and get Jeff up to the house in his place. The new houseboy caught on monstrous fast, 
and it wasn't no time hardly before Mars Dougal and old Miss both commenced to allow Hannibal was the best houseboy they ever had. He was pert and supple, quick as lightning, and sharp as a razor. But Chloe didn't like his ways. He was so sure he was going to get her in the spring that it didn't appear to allow he had to do any courting. And when he'd run across Chloe about the house, he'd swell round her in a biggity way and say, Come here and kiss me, honey. You're going to be mine in the spring. You don't appear to be as fond of me as you ought to be. Chloe didn't care nothing for Hannibal and hadn't cared nothing for him. And she sought just as much stole by Jeff as she did the day she first laid eyes on him. And the more familiar this year Hannibal got, the more Chloe let her mind run on Jeff. And one evening she went down to the quarters and watched till she got a chance for to talk with him by herself. And she told Jeff for to go down and see old Aunt Peggy, the conjure woman down by the Wilmington Road, and ask her to give him something to help get Hannibal out in the big house so the white folks would send for Jeff again. And being as Jeff didn't have nothing to give Aunt Peggy, Chloe got him a silver dollar and a silk handkerchief for the pair with, for Aunt Peggy never liked to work for nobody for nothing. So Jeff slipped off down to Aunt Peggy's one night and gunned the present he brung her and told her all about him and Chloe and Hannibal and asked her to help him out. Aunt Peggy told him she'd work her roots and for him to come back the next night and she'd tell him what she could do for him. So the next night Jeff went back and Aunt Peggy got him a baby doll with a body made out in a piece of corn stalk and with splinters for arms and legs and a head made out in elderberry peth and two little red peppers for feet. This here baby doll, says she, is Hannibal. This here peth head is Hannibal's head and these here pepper feet is Hannibal's feet. You take this and hide it under the house on the sill under the door where Hannibal have to walk over it every day. And as long as Hannibal comes anywhere near this baby doll, he'll be just like it is, light-headed and hot-footed. And if them two things don't get him into trouble mighty soon, then I'm no conjure woman. But when you get Hannibal back out in the house and get all through with this baby doll, you must fetch it back to me, for it's monstrous powerful goofer and is liable to make more trouble if you leave it laying around. Well, Jeff took the baby doll and slipped up to the big house and whistled to Chloe. And when she come out, he told her what old Aunt Peggy had said. And Chloe showed him how to get under the house. And when he had put the conjure doll on the sill, he went along back to the quarters and just waited. Next day, sure enough, the goofer commenced to work. Hannibal started in the house soon in the morning with an armful of wood to make a fire and he hadn't more than got across the dough sill before his feet begun to burn so that he dropped the armful of wood on the floor and woke old miss up an hour sooner than usual and course old miss didn't like that and spoke sharp about it when dinner time come and hannibal was helping the cook carry the dinner from the kitchen into the big house and was getting close to the dough where he had to go in his feet started to burn and his head began to swim and he let the big dish of chicken and dumplings fall right down in the dirt in the middle of the yard and the white folks had to make their dinner that day off in cold ham and sweet taters. The next morning he overslept himself and got into mo trouble. After breakfast, Mars Dougal sent him over to Mars Marable Utley's for to borrow a monkey wrench. He ought to been back in half an hour, but he come poking home by dinner time with a screwdriver instead of a monkey wrench. Mars Dougal sent another nigger back with the screwdriver, and Hannibal didn't get no dinner. Along in the afternoon, old Miss sought Hannibal to weedin' the flowers in the front garden, and Hannibal dug up all the bulbs old Miss had sent away for, and paid a lot of money for, and took em down to the hog pen by the barnyard and fed em to the hogs. When old Miss come out in the cool of the evening and see what Hannibal had done, she was most crazy and she wrote a note and sent Hannibal down to the overseer with it. But what Hannibal got from the overseer didn't appear to do no good. Every now and then his feet had commenced to torment him, and his mind had get all mixed up, and his conduct keep getting worser and worser, till finally the white folks couldn't stand it no longer, and Mars Dougal took Hannibal back down to the quarters. Mrs. Smith, says Mars Dougal to the overseer, 
This here niggas done got so trifling here lately that we can't keep em in the house no more, and I has fought em to you to be straightened up. You's had occasion to deal with him once, so he knows what to expect. You just take him in hand and let me know how he turns out. And when the hands come in from the field this evening, you can send that yellow nigger Jeff up to the house. I'll try him and see if he's any better than Hannibal. So Jeff went up to the big house and pleased Miles Dugan and old Miss and the rest of the family so well that they all got to lacking him first rate. And they'd have forgot all about Hannibal if it hadn't been for the bad reports what come up from the quarters bottom for a month or so. Fact is that Chloe and Jeff were so interested in one another since Jeff been up to the house that they forgot all about taking the baby doll back to Aunt Peggy, and it kept working for a while and making Hannibal's feet burn more or less till all the folks on the plantation got to calling him Hotfoot Hannibal. He kept getting more and more trifling till he got the name of being the most no countess nigger on the plantation, and Mars Dugal had to threaten to sell him in the spring, when by and by the goofer quit working, and Hannibal commenced to pick up some and make folks set a little more stow by him. Now this here Hannibal was a monstrous smart nigger, and when he got rid of them saw feet, his mind kept running on his other troubles. Here three or four weeks before, he'd had an easy job waiting on the white folks living off in the fat of the land and promised the finest gal on the plantation for a wife in the spring and now here he was back in the cornfield with the overseer cussing and a rarin if he didn't get a hard task done with nothing but corn bread and bacon and molasses to eat and all the field hands making remarks and poking fun at him cause he'd been sunk back from the big house to the field and the more hannibal studied about it the more matter he got till he finally swore he was going to get even with Jeff and Chloe if it was the last act. So Hannibal slipped away from the quarters one Sunday and hid in the cone up close to the big house till he see Chloe going down the road. He waylaid her and says he, Hi there, Chloe. I ain't got no time for the food with field hands, says Chloe, tossing her head. What you want with me, hot foot? I wants to know how you and Jeff is getting along. I allows that's none of your business, nigger. I don't see what case in any common field hand has got to mix in with the affairs of folks what lives in the big house. But if it'll do you any good to know, I might say that me and Jeff is getting along mighty well, and we're going to get married in the spring. And you ain't going to be invited to the wedding, nother. No, no, says he. I wouldn't expect to be invited to the wedding, a common low-down field hand like I is but I was glad to hear you and Jeff is getting along so well. I didn't know but what he had commenced to be a little tired. Tired of me? That's ridiculous, says Chloe. Why, that nigger lusts me so, I believe he'd go through fine water for me. That nigger is just wrapped up in me. Uh-huh, says Hannibal. Then I reckon there must be some other nigger what meets a woman down by the creek in the swamp every Sunday evening, to say nothing about two or three times a week. Yes, it is another nigger, and you was a liar when you say it was Jeff. Maybe I is a liar, and maybe I ain't got good eyes. But lessen I is a liar, and lessen I ain't got good eyes, Jeff is going to meet that woman this evening, long about eight o'clock, right down there by the creek in the swamp, about halfway betwixt this plantation and Mars Marable Utley's. Well, Chloe told Hannibal she didn't believe a word he said and call him a low-down nigger who was trying to slander Jeff cause he was more lucky than he was. But all the same, she couldn't keep her mind from running on what Hannibal had said. She remembered she'd heard one of the niggers say there was a gal over at Mars Marable Utley's plantation where Jeff used to go with some before he got acquainted with Chloe. Then she commenced to figure back, and sure enough there was two or three times in the last week when she'd been helping the ladies with their dressing and other fixings in the evening, and Jeff might have gone down to the swamp without her knowing about it at all. And then she commenced to remember little things which she had took no notice of before, and what would make it appear like Jeff had something on his mind. Chloe set a monstrous heap of stow by Jeff, and would have done most anything for him, so long as he stuck to her. But Chloe was a mighty jealous woman, and while she didn't believe what Hannibal said, she see how it could have been so, and she determined to find out for herself whether it was so or no. 
Now, Chloe hadn't seen Jeff all day, for Mars Dugas had sent Jeff over to his daughter's house, young Miss Margaret's, what lived about four miles from Mars Dugal's, and Jeff wasn't expected home till evening. But just after supper was over, and while the ladies was setting out on the piazza, Chloe slipped off from the house and run down the road. This here the same road we come. And when she got most to the crick, this here the same crick right before us, she kind of kept in the bushes at the side of the road, till finally she see Jeff sitting on the bank on the other side of the crick, right under that old willow tree dropping over the water yonder. And every now and then he'd get up and look up the road towards Mars Maribos on the other side of the swamp. First, Chloe felt like she'd go right over the crick and give Jeff a piece of her mind. Then she allowed she'd better be sure before she'd done anything. So she held herself in best she could, getting madder and madder every minute, till by and by she see the woman coming down the road on the other side from towards Mars Maribel Utley's plantation. And when she see Jeff jump up and run towards that woman and throw his arms round her neck, poor Chloe didn't stop to see no more, but just turned round and run up to the house and rush up on the piazza and up and told Mars Dugal and old Miss all about the baby doll and all about Jeff getting a goofer from Aunt Peggy and about what the goofer had done to Hannibal. Mars Dugal was monstrous mad. He didn't let on at first like he believed Chloe, but when she took and showed him where to find the baby doll, Mars Dugal turned white as chalk. What devil's work is this? says he. No wonder the poor nigger's feet itched. Something got to be done to lunt that old witch to keep her hands off my niggers. And as for this here Jeff, I'm going to do just what I promise, so the darkies on his plantation will know I means what I says. For Mars Dugal had warned the hands before about fooling with conjuration. Fact, he had lost one or two niggers himself from they being goofered, and he would have had old Aunt Piggy whipped long ago, only Aunt Piggy was a free woman and he was feared she'd conj him. And whilst Mars Dugal say he didn't believe in conjuring and such, he appeared to lie it was best to be on the safe side and let Aunt Peggy alone. So Mars Dugal done just as he say. If old Miss had plead for Jeff, he might have kept him. But old Miss hadn't got over losing him bulbs yet, and she never said a word. Mars Dugal took Jeff to town next day and sold him to a speculator, who started down the river with him next morning on a steamboat for to take him to Alabama. Now, when Chloe told old Mars Dougal about this here baby doll and this other goofer, she hadn't hardly allowed Mars Dougal would sell Jeff down south. Howsomever, she was so mad with Jeff that she swayed herself she didn't care, and so she held her head up and went round looking like she was real glad about it. But one day she was walking down the road when who should come long but this year Hannibal? When Hannibal seed her, he bust out laughing fitting for the kill. Ya, 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 ho, 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 ha, ha, ha. Oh, hold me, honey, hold me. I'll laugh myself to death. I ain't never laughed so much since I've been born. What you laughing at, Hotfoot? Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ya, yeah. what I laughing at? Why, well, I was laughing at myself, to be sure laughing to think what a fine woman I made. Chloe turned pale, and a heart come up in her mouth. What you mean, nigger? says she, catching hold to a bush by the road for to steady herself. What you mean by the kind of woman you made? What do I mean? I means that I got squared up with you for treat me the way you done, and I got even with that yellow nigger, Jeff, for cutting me out. Now he's going to know what it is to eat cornbread and molasses once more, and work from daylight to dark, and to have an overseer driving him from one day's end to the other. I means that I sent word to Jeff that Sunday that you was going to be over to Mars Marable's visiting that evening, and you want him to meet you down by the creek on the way home and go the rest of the road with you. And then I put on a frock and a sunbonnet and fix myself up to look like a woman, and when Jeff seed me coming, he run to meet me. And you seed him, for I'd been a watchin' in the bushes before and discovered you comin' down the road. And now I reckon you and Jeff both knows what it means to mess with a nigger like me. Poor Chloe hadn't heard more than half of the last part of what Hannibal said, but she had heard enough to lunt that this nigger had fooled her and Jeff, and that poor Jeff hadn't done nothing, 
and that for loving her too much and going to meet her, she had caused him to be sold away, where she'd never, never see him no more. The sun might shine by day, the moon by night, the flowers might bloom and the mockingbirds might sing, but poor Jeff was done lost to her forever and forever. Hannibal hadn't more than finished what he had to say when Chloe's knees gun away on her, and she fell down in the road and lay there half an hour or so before she come to. When she did, she crept up to the house just as pale as a ghost. And for a month or so, she crawled round the house and appeared to be so poorly that Mars Dougal sent for a doctor, and the doctor kept on asking her questions till it found she was just pining away for Jeff. When he told Mars Dougal, Mars Dougal laughed and said he fixed that. She could have the new houseboy for a husband. But old Miss say, no, Chloe ain't that kind of gal, and that Mars Dougal should buy Jeff back. So, Mars Dougal read a letter to this here speculator down to Wilmington, and told if he ain't sold that nigger South what he bought from him, he'd like to buy him back again. Chloe commenced to pick up a little when old Miss told about this letter. Howsomever, by and by, Mars Dougal got an answer from the speculator, who said he was monstrous sorry, but Jeff had fell overboard or jump off in the steamboat on the way to Wilmington and got drowned, and cause he couldn't sell him back, much as he'd like to please Mars Dougal. Well, after Chloe heard this, she wasn't much more use to nobody. She pretended to do her work, and old Miss put up with her and had the doctor give her medicine and let her go to the circus and all sorts of things for to take her mind off in her troubles, but they didn't none of em do no good. Chloe got to slipping down here in the evening just like she is coming to meet Jeff, and she sit there under that willow tree on the other side and wait for him night after night. By and by she got so bad the white folks sawn her over to young Miss Margaret's for to give her a change, but she runned away the first night, and when they looked for her the next morning, they found a corpse laying in the branch yonder, right across from where we sitting now. Ever since then, said Julius in conclusion, Chloe's haunt comes every evening and sits down under that willow tree and waits for Jeff or else walks up and down the road yonder, looking and looking and waiting and waiting for a sweetheart what ain't never ever come back to her no more. There was silence when the old man had finished, and I am sure I saw a tear in my wife's eye and more than one in Mabel's. I think Julius said my wife, after a moment, that you may turn the mare around and go by the long road. The old man obeyed with alacrity, and I noticed no reluctance on the mare's part. You are not afraid of Chloe's haunt, are you? I asked jocularly. My mood was not responded to, and neither of the ladies smiled. Oh, no, said Annie, but I've changed my mind. I prefer the other route. When we had reached the main road, and had proceeded along it for a short distance, we met a cart driven by a young negro, and on the cart were a trunk and a valise. We recognized the man as Malcolm Murchison's servant, and drew up a moment to speak to him. "'Who's going away, Marshal?' I inquired. "'Young Mr. Malcolm gone away on the boat to New York this evening, sir, and I'm taking his things down to the wharf, sir.' This was news to me and I heard it with regret. My wife looked sorry, too, and I could see that Mabel was trying hard to hide her concern. He's coming long behind, sir, and I expect she'll meet him up the road a piece. He's going to walk down as far as Mr. Jim Williams's and take the buggy from there to town. He expects to be gone a long time, sir, and say probably he ain't never coming back. The man drove on. There were few words exchanged in an undertone between my wife and Mabel, which I did not catch. Then Annie said, Julius, you may stop the rock away a moment. There are some trumpet flowers by the road there that I want. Will you get them for me, John? I sprang into the underbrush and soon returned with a great bunch of scarlet blossoms. Where is Mabel? I asked, noting her absence. She has walked on ahead. We shall overtake her in a few minutes. The carriage had gone only a short distance when my wife discovered that she had dropped her fan. I had it where we were stopping. Julius, will you go back and get it for me? Julius got down and went back for the fan. 
he was an unconscionably long time finding it. After we got started again, we had gone only a little way when we saw Mabel and young Murchison coming toward us. They were walking arm in arm, and their faces were aglow with the light of love. I do not know whether or not Julius had a previous understanding with Malcolm Murchison, by which he was to drive us round by the long road that day, nor do I know exactly what motive influenced the old man's exertions in the matter. He was fond of Mabel, but I was old enough and knew Julius well enough to be skeptical of his motives. It is certain that a most excellent understanding existed between him and Murchison after the reconciliation and that when the young people set up housekeeping over at the old Murchison place, Julius had an opportunity to enter their service. For some reason or other, however, he preferred to remain with us. The mare, I might add, was never known to balk again. End of Hotfoot Hannibal Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista End of The Conjure Woman by Charles Waddell Chestnut